This episode of the DTFH is brought to you by those sweet, sweet wizards of HTML over at Squarespace.com. Head to Squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code DUNCAN to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain name. Hello, my sweet and beautiful friends. It is I, D. Trussell, and thou art listening to the Duncan Trussell Family Hour Podcast. And I'm reporting into you from an Airbnb located deep in the sultry heart of Los Feliz. I had an incredible synchronicity happen. Amazing synchronicity. Mind-boggling synchronicity. Something so profound and overwhelming and simultaneously mundane that it makes it almost impossible to talk about without seeming ridiculous. Because to explain it, you've got to get into Burning Man. And to get into Burning Man, you got to immediately figure out a way to scrabble over the psychological force fields and impervious membranes that immediately spring up around a person who's never been to the festival when anyone dares mention the name of the festival. It's a fascinating thing. It's very similar to the phenomena that happens when someone's like, Do you, I want to tell you this crazy dream I had last night. And you're like, all right, here we go. What's your dream? But inside you're thinking, I don't, I, I don't know how to, con- it's hard for me to connect with stories anyone tells me about day-to-day existence, much less this strange, gooey, amorphous, pulsating oddness that happened while your body was in a paralyzed state. I don't know exactly how to react when you tell me the dream you had of how you're floating in a raft made of dicks on an ocean of jizz underneath a sun that looked like your mom. I don't know. It's an amazing thing to hear and it's an incredible story, but ultimately there could be some reason that your brain wants you to forget about it. And this is what Burning Man is like. It's like this liminal state. It's a kind of shared dream that 70,000 people are having and we leave the desert rambling like we've just been staring into the Necronomicon. So I'm sorry, you're just going to have to let it run its course, friends. I'm going to be babbling about it for a little bit longer, I suspect. Okay, so there's my disclaimer. Anyway, Burning Man, it's made up of camps. And one of my favorite camps at Burning Man is the Bureau of Misinformation. This is a camp that was founded by Russian billionaire Dmitry Ichkov, and it's a camp that is dedicated to beautiful, magical, cacophonous dishonesty. When you go to this camp, they have an amazing bar. They make delicious drinks. And while you're at the bar, the members of the bureau, they just lie to you. They just lie and lie and lie. And even when you think they're done lying, they're not done lying. They never stop lying, or maybe they do. But what happens is this beautiful surrender to their benevolent form of mischievousness and its uh, simultaneous commentary on the wavery nature of truth itself and how uh, we kind of build a universe with lies and within those lies the universe could actually somehow be true it gets really deep and kaleidoscopic and especially psychedelic when you're in the desert and you've been drinking lots of very strong mint tea. Thus, it's one of my favorite camps at Burning Man, and uh, this year it was the first place that I visited. They're an amazing camp, and they don't just lie. They also uh, offer a lot to the festival. The people at the camp volunteer to help with the ice tent. Like one of the one of the only things you can buy at Burning Man is ice. And you need ice if you're out in the desert for a week because you got to put ice in your cooler to keep your beer and your food cold. So it's a very complicated thing getting ice at Burning Man. And the members of the Bureau of Misinformation have uh, volunteered and they spend a lot of time out in the hot sun helping people going through the kind of, I don't want to like knock the festival, but the relative overly bureaucratic procedure of getting ice at the festival. It kind of takes time and there's a specific way people have to get it and the Bureau is there to help them. So they're not all about lies. They're also about helping people get ice at the festival. Anyway, here's what happened. I checked into this Airbnb. I randomly just picked this Airbnb out of 
any number of potential Airbnbs. I check in a little bit early. I'm laying on the couch getting my ass kicked at Hearthstone when the door opens and standing in the doorway is Pixie, one of the members of the Bureau of Misinformation. Now, when something like this happens, when two things that shouldn't come together, come together, it really does make steam come out your ears as your brain desperately grasps for some kind of easy way to explain the fact that these two completely separate things, the Bureau of Misinformation and the Airbnb you've randomly picked have suddenly come slamming together in this beautiful way. As it turns out, just from sheer coincidence, synchronicity, or some benevolent malevolence in the universe, I happened to pick an Airbnb being run by a member of the Bureau of Misinformation. And when they saw that I was coming to the Airbnb, they were like, oh shit, we got to fuck with Duncan. And so Pixie has come, came over with a sign that says, Duncan, the Bureau is always watching. The idea is they were going to plaster this up somewhere and throw their various bits of awesome swag about but i happen to be here early so it was in a lot of ways way cooler because i got to have a personal interaction with the bureau and it was really cool and really trippy and exactly the kind of magic that i love something simultaneously mundane and incredible something so wild that even talking about it you might just be like man who gives a shit? That doesn't sound that crazy, but think about it. Imagine, let's say, that we had access to Dmitry Ichkov, the founder of the Bureau of Misinformation Supercomputers, and we could put in there, what are the probabilities of like picking an Airbnb in Los Angeles open for the exact amount of days that you needed to stay in Los Angeles that happened to be run by one of your favorite camps at Burning Man dedicated to tricking people well i imagine the odds are highly improbable like one in a million one in a i mean i don't know how many airbnbs are available in los angeles i guess that's where you start and then the number of airbnbs but then it would have to be within that window of time and then you see this is where the mind starts spinning and whirling desperately trying to construct some way to rationalize synchronicity which in all forms, no matter how mundane or spectacular, seems to indicate a greater rhythm to things in the universe that far surpasses our ability to cognize what's going down. So, man, this is a glorious synchronicity, and it's um, even more exciting to think that um, I... I got to have a pretty incredible conversation that coincidentally happened to be about synchronicity with Shane Moss. You might be asking yourself or saying to yourself, wait a minute, during this conversation with Shane Moss, you talk about how you're already rambling about synchronicity at the beginning of the podcast before the podcast started, and you guys were talking about synchronicity, and yet you're talking about this conversation as though it already happened. Well, that's because the first part of the opening monologue you just listened to was before I talked to Shane Moss and I cut in after I talked to Shane Moss. I'm not trying to trick you guys, but what ended up happening with this weird convergence here on the fall equinox is the conversation took place within a place already magically blessed by the forces of synchronicity. And then the con conversation began to uh, revolve around the strangeness of synchronicity. And then if you listen to this episode, you will actually witness a wild synchronicity that happens within the episode itself. Really cool. What does it mean? Who knows? But it seems like this particular podcast was meant to take place in one of the enclaves of the Bureau of Misinformation because this, of all the podcasts I've done, this has to be the most psychedelic of all of them. So strap in, friends, and I don't know, maybe this one needs a disclaimer. Get ready. Don't drive a car and listen to this episode. And if you've been drinking super strong mint tea, I don't know, man. This one could be the thing that pushes you over the edge. Now, what's on the other side of the edge? Well, if you ask me, exponentially increasing levels of beauty but some people report a different version of what lies over the edge maybe the 
thing that gets your head spinning is that you pick what's over the edge. Maybe you've already fallen over the edge a long time ago, and this entire experience that you call human existence, including this weird moment where my raspy lesbian voice is flowing through your earbuds into your waxy ear holes is just a byproduct of infinitely falling over the edge, falling and tumbling eternally into this incredible incarnation that you're experiencing that you won't be experiencing forever, but maybe you will. You guys know what I'm saying? I hope so, because I don't. Anyway, strap in, babies. We're going to dive right into this episode, but first, some quick business. This episode of the DTFH was made possible by those sweet lambs of God over at squarespace.com. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code DUNCAN to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. My loves, there's a lot of ways that you can make a website. You can ascend to the top of some distant mountain where an HTML expert is living in some kind of beautiful palace made of magical ice, dancing with unicorns and enjoying the fruits of his labor because he charges lots and lots of money because designing websites is super difficult. Sure, you could have an HTML craftsman hew some website together using some ancient Nordic keyboard given to him by Thor and you're going to pay him hundreds of thousands of dollars for your website or at least a few grand or I don't know how much. It's expensive, man. Or you can go over to squarespace.com and start building a website today. You could turn your awesome idea into a glorious website. I use Squarespace. If you go to DunkinTrussell.com, that's a Squarespace website. Anytime I upload an episode of this podcast, I upload it using Squarespace, and um, they're amazing. Never had a problem with it. They've got incredible customer service, 24 hours. If you got any kind of problem, they'll email you back right away. And the glorious thing is, if you sign up for a year, you get a free domain name. Listen, you don't have to just make a website because you want to like have some kind of like online presence for your amazing Brooklyn dineria that serves magic fucking eggs mixed with hay, you can actually just make a website totally dedicated to cacophony, to the glorious deception we were talking about earlier. You can make a ridiculous website. I suck my grandma's nipples.com. I bet that, oh, it's probably been taken. But there's lots of other possibilities out there. I found the eagle egg.com. Think of all the incredible, just basic domain. You just pick anything, man. So many great pranks. My God. My God. In my younger days, in the younger days when I was more into pulling tricks on people, I, I don't know what I would have done with access to squarespace.com. But you now have access. All you got to do is go to squarespace.com, use offer code Duncan. You could do a free trial so to see if it's something that you want or if it works for you. But if you're thinking about making a website, I use them and they're awesome. And if you use offer code Duncan, you'll get 10% off. And I must say, I would be remiss if I did not mention, I know someone who sells their socks online. Think about that. She harvests, harvests the smell of her feet and sells it online. She makes money from stinky socks. The implications are startling. Any kind of entrepreneur with stinky feet these days can make thousands and thousands of dollars with just a little, with a few, with a, all you need is access to what? I don't know, six girls and six treadmills? You don't even need treadmills. Just start a sock farm. You could easily start harvesting stinky socks. Come up with some kind of, distribution service that doesn't break postal codes and laws and bam you're you're gonna be living in a you're gonna be able to tell your kid you know what paid for your college boy sock money so give it a shot squarespace.com offer code duncan you'll get 10 percent off sign up for a year you get a free domain name this website is also made 
possible by thetracker.com. Go to thetracker.com slash Duncan to get 20% off any order. Wallet, phone, keys. Why does leaving the house always turn into the world's most annoying scavenger hunt? Eight years ago, Tracker changed everything when they released their first tracking device. And now they've done it again with the all-new Track R Pixel. With Track R Pixel, you'll never worry about losing your things again. Track R Pixel is the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. Place Track R Pixel on whatever you tend to lose. Keys, wallets, even your cat. It's small enough to fit anywhere. When you misplace an item that has a tracker pixel attached, use your smartphone and a 90 decibel alert will help you find it in seconds. It even has a powerful LED light so you can find anything even in the dark. Lose your phone? Just press the button on your tracker pixel and your phone rings even if it's on silent. You can even locate your item if it's miles away because every tracker user is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. It's like ways for finding your thing. Things, whichever. And Tracker's 30 day money back guarantee means you truly have nothing to lose. Go to thetracker.com slash Duncan to get 20% off any order. That's the trackr.com slash Duncan for 20% off the T H E T R A C K R dot com slash Duncan. My sweet friends, if at this moment you're reeling in horror at the fact that there are two advertisements back to back in the part in the beginning of the DTFH, worry no more. All you got to do is go to patreon.com forward slash DTFH and subscribe and you will get ad free versions of the DTFH. Also, anytime I record an interview, I upload it to Patreon so you'll have early access. And also, if you really want to dive deep into the thing, sign up over there and there's um, opening rambles and rants and weird monologues that I just didn't feel like were were ready to go up on the main feed or I felt too crazy to put it up on the main feed or I, I don't know. I just like, there's a lot of just... Oh, like we go deeper over there, man. It's cool. It feels like, uh, like a little club or something. And also, here's what's really crazy: we've ex- we have like f- over 500 subscribers now. So let's go for a thousand. Dive in patreon.com forward slash dtfh. No more ads. Just me and my seemingly lesbian raspy voice rambling on and on and on. What else could you long for? Want to? fucking hardcore burning man ear beating i've got an hour and 20 minute diatribe on burning man over there if you really like if you, if you really just want to want to if you've been thinking about like buying one of those punching machines and standing in front of it and like just just letting it beat your ear to a bloody waxy pulp those things are expensive rather than do that go to patreon.com forward slash dtfh and for mere pennies every day, my voice will hammer against your sweet, delightful, aromatic ear holes for as long as you want it to. Patreon.com forward slash DTFH. Join us. Also, much thanks to those of you who continue to use our Amazon link located at DuncanTrussell.com. Anytime you go through that link to buy some assemblage of atomic particulates, we get a very small percentage of it. And man, I've just got to keep saying it again and again. You want to buy something cool? You want to really like just do something that doesn't make sense? Having a midlife crisis and thinking about becoming a global international DJ? Then you should go to Amazon through the link and pick up an Ableton Push 2. One of the coolest midi controllers of course then you got to get ableton on top of it but why not start a career in music become an international dj and when you get to some global level maybe you can fly me around on your beautiful private jet i would enjoy that a lot we could even do a podcast from your incredible private jet as we sip champagne and gaze over the playa that would be a dream come true for me regardless thanks to those of you who continue to use the link we also have a lot of swag over at duncantrussell.com if you want to buy a t-shirt poster etc all right that's it listen if you don't want to listen to these rambling opening uh, consumeristic 
fucking things, just go to patreon.com forward slash DTFH. You can avoid all of it or just skip ahead. It won't hurt my feelings. Regardless, thank you for your patience and for listening to me and for allowing me to do this as a job. I love you guys. Now prepare yourselves. Sprinkle holy water on your head. You know what? Just I'm going to have to recite my favorite Coleridge, the end of, of Kublai Khan, to bless this episode, only because, my God, if anything speaks to the beauty and dangers of the psychedelic life, that poem is all about it, and, the, and it ends like this. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. She was a fair Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abara. Could I revive within me that symphony and song? To such a deep delight would win me that with music loud and long, I would build those domes in air, those sunny domes, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair, cross yourselves with holy dread, and weave a circle round him thrice. For he on honeydew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. This conversation with Shane Moss made me feel as though I were speaking with someone who had just returned from the sacred gardens of Kublai Khan. When in fact it's somebody who'd returned from a psychiatric hospital after having a nervous breakdown from the combination of a really intense touring schedule mixed in with making a documentary on psychedelics mixed in with an overabundance of psychedelic consumption and yet still on the other side shane moss returns just as amazing with an incredible story to tell and a lot of new information to digest so please Send out as much love as you can. Embrace Shane Moss's astral form. Embrace the idea that we're all one thing anyway. And send that love to sweet Shane Moss wherever he may happen to be at this moment in the time-space continuum. I'll have all the links you need to find Shane Moss, links to his incredible podcast, his touring schedule, etc. at DuncanTrussell.com. And everybody, please, welcome to the DT. F. H. Shane Moss. Shane, welcome back to the DTFH. I'm so excited. Me too, man. This and but, it's exciting to have you here because you have an amazing story <laughs> to share with our friends. Since the, la the last time you were here, yeah. you were about to go on this big tour. Yeah, you were shooting this documentary on yeah, psychedelics, yeah. which you can are continuing to do. But we kind of just finished shooting, and it's going to be out next year. But this fascinating event occurred <laughs> that was kind of, it wasn't probably when you were like sticking things to the wall on with the structure of this story or what it could possibly yeah. be. Certainly this wasn't written down. Uh, no, not at all. Tell us about uh, it. Uh, I, I don't know if I should uh, if I should cut right to the chase or what, but I, I basically um, I I got uh Let's start with the the kind of ending, and then we can expand on that. I just got out of a psych ward uh, right. recently, and uh, I spent seven days in a psych ward. So what happened was, I was. It's. Uh, I wonder how far back I. So. Yeah, start at the beginning. I mean, let's talk about what your tour was about. Yeah. What the documentary is about, and yeah. then we'll jump to this, to this into the psych ward. So. I think around uh, last year uh, or or two years ago, uh, no, last year I started. Uh, so I've I've always been manic depressive. Like uh, 
I, I didn't know that there was levels like uh, bipolar one and bipolar two. And then I guess there's like subtle ones, like everyone's on the spectrum somewhere. Like everyone's like at least a four or something right, like that. Right, sure. And, um, and so I was always a two. So that means that you're depressed most of the time. And then once in a while you're like, I'm going to be a famous comedian on TV. Oh, and then fuck. that's kind of what keeps When you were going. you diagnosed? Well, just recently I got diagnosed with because I shot up into one and that's when it became really problematic. But I've known it my whole life. It's it's like a, it's like I've known that I've been that I've had like an incredibly bad attention span and kind of ADHD my whole life. It's just like when you tell people they're like, well, have you been diagnosed? I'm like, well, no, I just know, like ask anyone that spends time with me or right. any of my but you were never like officially. No, I just read about it, and so I was like, "Oh, that's what's wrong with so me." So you self-diagnosed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You said, and you thought, "Oh, I, I'm bipolar." Yeah, and I didn't, but I didn't know that there was like two and one and all of this. And so recently, I got the the one is what put me in the psych ward. Um, so that's when you like don't sleep for long periods of time and exceptionally grandiose ideas. So it goes from like, "I'm going to be a comedian" to I'm going to change the laws of physics with my mind. That's the <laughs> difference between two and one. The second one sounds easier than the first. It really is. Like the, the second one is just like general thoughts of like suicide of just like, oh, you know, this is pretty meaningless. Like what, you, you know, <laughs> you, you ever see like those, I was just thinking about this yesterday. Uh, you know, those math prodigies that yes. like like some child math prodigy that like just offs himself at 14 no, <laughs> i'm I, always like i kind of get it like like they they figured out the formula like carry the one and right. it's meaningless yes oh you think that's why they off themselves it's yeah they solved it they they come the, the, <laughs> they figured the it solution out solution that equals meaningless you think is like that's the and yeah so but i think we're getting let's right before we get to that sure, point sure, sure. where you're the psychedelic math genius draw <laughs> the window of your soul. I don't soul think that about black. myself. No, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, by the way, I'm not like saying like, this is yeah. who you're saying you are. I think, I think a lot of people think of that, think of you as a super intelligent, <laughs> philosophical. This is why people love your podcast and people love, love coming to the show is because your ability to articulate what psychedelics are, how they affect the brain, how what what's going on up there during mm -hmm. a psychedelic state and your i think ability to kind of like be pretty agnostic about what that could be is <laughs> people love it so i would think of you in that way oh, right thank you so as we're is, is so here you are this psychedelic math whiz mm -hmm. writing this equation <laughs> yeah <laughs> on the window of your soul uh, yeah yeah that equals meaningless. Look, I think we're all doing very complicated math inside of our heads all of the time. It's just not like we're just not consciously right. aware of it. For I sure. think that in our heads there's like these insane panoramic formulas that we can't possibly comprehend that Has we kind of dumb down into this little like, oh, we put this plus this equals this. And it's just like such a dumbed down model of what math actually is. Or it manifests in the form of stories, mythologies religion mm. like the math comes out in a bunch of different ways it doesn't just come out as pure math yeah it comes out as sometimes god incarnates into this dimension mm -hmm. as this particular entity and people look at that and they're like that's a bunch of fucking bullshit mm -hmm. but then when you start breaking down that story you realize yeah. oh that has like it has a weirdly mathematical foundation to it <laughs> based on like yeah. meaninglessness and meaning nothingness and somethingness and the crazy interaction between these two polarities produces this infinite array of reality right? <laughs> yeah it's, yeah so this is why i should have just called you immediately when i was starting to have some issues because you would have just been like oh yeah 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 of course like yeah. all, everything you're saying makes sense it just wasn't making sense to a lot of people well because I, it was very much along those lines it was well let's so but before so, we get to i want to talk yeah. about this is first of all the obvious paradox mm -hmm. of a person who's on tour i don't know if you'd call it a paradox but Here's a person on tour talking about psychedelics. I think it would be safe to call you a psychedelic advocate. Sure. Right? Yeah. And, and suddenly, in the midst of this psychedelic <laughs> advocacy, in the midst of shooting a documentary yeah. on the 
mostly, I guess, like here's why psychedelics are great. You end up in a mental hospital. Yeah. Because, probably because of overuse of psychedelics. Is that yeah. safe to say? That is. I mean, my album before this was about breaking both my feet too. So I think it's, <laughs> I think that people should know that I just push the boundaries right. a bit. That's, I'm just, I like jumping. Uh, and I like jumping into things and I like going across that threshold of reason. Um, and so I, I was thinking this the other day about it, like how, I, I'm definitely an advocate for research. I don't, I've always been like, I don't think they're for everybody. And then at the same, because I was like, well, I'm like pro NASA, but I don't think everyone should be like crammed into this ship. You right. Know? Like, yeah, sure. No, you have to see the world from up there. It'll right. change the way you look at everything. And right. some people are just like, I'm okay with not being an astronaut. Yeah, like, right. I have other interests and I think that's okay. But I, so... I stumbled on mushrooms as like a really nice way to battle my depression because the depression lasted so much longer than the mania. And so I think a little over a year ago, I started using mushrooms about two to three times a week for about a month. And that just kicked out my depression. And then I was just like normal, balanced person, didn't need mushrooms anymore. I wasn't doing psychedelics really the whole time I was on tour. And then my depression came back about nine months later. And I was like, oh, I know what to do this time. And so I started doing mushrooms two to three times a week again for like a month. And then same thing happened. I was like, depression's gone. And then I was like, well, I'm now I'm making this documentary about psychedelics. It's helping me. The more psychedelics I do, the more I can kind of articulate the experience. Sure. And... Why just feel fine? Maybe I can bump it up to like good. Yeah. And then so I kept on with that pattern, and then it did like it bumped up to good. And, uh, and let's I, talk about the what psychedelic diet you were on, and at, at the peak of this thing, like what were you taking <laughs> each day? So it, it it was like two or two, three times a week I was doing mushrooms, and depending on how I felt, sometimes it would just be like a gram, sometimes it would be like five, six grams. Okay. And and then were the, you drinking? So I quit drinking at the end of June, and that's when I went from like feeling good to feeling amazing because alcohol is a depressant. Okay. And I was like kind of a wild. I'm like a bit of a wild man when it comes to alcohol, uh, and I have issues. I like, okay. I mean, we've drank together. Like I once I start drinking, I just keep on slamming them back. Yeah, and, we drank when you came into New York. And, yeah. and we played board games. And yeah. we, we got hammered. We were yeah. like <laughs> yeah. pounding them back. And as I recall, I mean, and stop me if like you don't want me to reveal. You were taking, you had some kind of, I don't know what it was, man. Like Amanita Muscaria t Oh, yeah. Amanita Muscaria, yeah. And so you were taking that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot remember? about and that. You were, yeah. And you were also drinking. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess you were taking mushrooms. What about DMT at the time? Were you doing DMT no, during this No, but time? that's when the story gets really crazy. Okay. But so, just let's just so people listening can yeah. like it because you know like I was doing Amanita muscaria a bunch, and that's supposed to be kind of like a waking dream, and that wasn't happening most of the time. But once I got really drunk and did Amanita muscaria, and for just like ten seconds, when I like freaked out, I sp I spoke Russian for like ten seconds. Wow! Like it tapped into some kind of yeah. <laughs> what, what like, are, they, what some the are you sure it wasn't like glissalia it wasn't just some random you're positive it was russian i felt like a russian guy like i was i was trying to get something out of my vehicle uh, of my toothbrush and stuff and uh and then instead i was like all of a sudden in this parallel reality where i was this russian guy trying to get something from his pickup truck Fuck. so you were and doing... like swearing in russian if you don't speak Russian, how do you know you're speaking Russian? That's it. I don't know. I think that I mean my like reasonable take on it is just Sounds that I've Russian. like watched the the show The Americans, and so maybe just like little bits of Russian just has started, gotten in there. You and just then started just... barfing up Russian <laughs> just, phrases from somewhere. Yeah, so yeah. You're, so and and I don't like trust that. I don't trust my memory of it. I don't trust that it was like perfect. It just felt Russian, and I don't know what the fuck I said. I tried to swear, and it came out in Russian. So you are taking so many psychedelics. Mm -hmm. You have begun to randomly speak Russian. Mm -hmm. Now it's right. also the important thing is this is happening <laughs> in the midst of uh, 
or I guess towards the end of this massive yeah. tour. And, I and you've been going tired. night after night yeah. after night after night doing what? How long is the show? Not taking care of I, like an hour and a half. Show. And you're sleeping in a van? No, I wish. No, I was sleeping in Airbnbs and stuff, taking okay. a car around. Yeah. But still, you're having to like get to a place, take yeah. a shower, drive to the show, go on stage, get yeah. to the next place, take a shower, drive to the... You're doing this like incredibly brutal job. Yeah. And as you're doing this job, you are taking Amanita Muscaria, yeah. psilocybin, and then what else? Do, do you recall you're drinking or you... Acid. I mean, I was really LSD. mixing it up a little bit. I did. Uh, I was doing a little more MDMA than usual. You doing any speed? No, I don't think so. Not really. Maybe coke a couple times. I so, don't so quite coke remember. So coke recreationally, but you're doing yeah. MDMA in the midst yeah. of all this yeah, on this yeah. tour. So, like, <laughs> I mean, looking back at it, I'm like, God, this is it's like, <laughs> I'm like, that was really way too much. Well, no, it it, it sounds yeah. like it went from exploration to drug binge. Really, yeah, it yeah. sounds like it was like you were doing an a classic Hunter S. Thompson level. <laughs> gonzo drug binge and it, you were you were it got there yeah it got there so you're not getting enough sleep and about six months into the tour of like six months of getting behind on emails and all the administrative busy stuff i had my first ever panic attack just like oh no i haven't done any like taking care of like parking tickets and things right. like just general maintenance stuff in six months because I've been in a new city every night. Yeah. And uh, it just freaked me out one night and I had my first panic attack and I knew it was a panic attack, but it felt like a heart attack. So I still went into a hospital to get checked out. Okay. So you like you, you have been so lax in responding to the, the, yeah. the demands of the bureaucratic world. Mm -hmm. That you actually thought you were having a heart attack yeah. when you realized, like, my fucking God, I've got all these bills, taxes, parking tickets. And that's actually when I started the psychedelic binge was after that. That was mid-February. And then I went on a psychedelic binge. But you went to the hospital. And that was like the same time that the documentary started shooting. Okay. So this is before the documentary yeah. starts. You've already checked yourself into a, yeah. an ER with a panic attack. Mm -hmm. So you know something's... Something's not going exactly yeah, right. Yeah, and I hadn't done... And In fact, it was probably the least amount of psychedelics at that time, the least amount of psychedelics I had done in some time. It, it had been like six months since the last time I had really done it. Maybe I had... I might have had one or two mushroom trips on the entire tour up until this point, and then I went on the binge after the panic attack. But then anxiety was coming into my trips way more than normal and a little more paranoia than normal. But um, How much... What is normal paranoia for you? Zero. Right. So all of a sudden you're starting to get little like whispers of the devil. Like, yeah, little, yeah, like, just, little, the, just little bit. Little snake tongues lapping yeah. at your earlobes a little yeah. bit. Like, hey, Shane. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not what you thought it was, is it, man? And and, and so, okay, so this is interesting, yeah. man. So, so I did start hearing a little bit of voices like that. Like, uh, like yeah. I Were started, you having I actually hearing, hearing voices? Just on, on mushrooms or during various like, – like if I went a little too hard at it and I was like, I need to sit down and like meditate and get in there, I would start hearing just a little bit in the way of voices, which I was like, ooh, that's, that's cool. interesting. <laughs> yeah. Right. Whereas most people are like, fuck, I'm hearing voices. You're like, whoa. <laughs> it's time to hang up the phone. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So this is what it's like to hear voices. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so you are, so when you started taking these psychedelics and hearing voices, mm -hmm. this is following the panic attack that put you in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And so now you we're so, you if you step back and look, you, you could probably see a lot of red flags popping up real early being like hey yeah might be time to sit it out for a little bit yeah Shane. yeah, like, yeah right but it needed some rest for a while yeah, yeah needed some rest but you were shooting this documentary on psychedelics yeah. and as a as a like with the heart of like some kind of anthropologist <laughs> yeah plunging in right. to the darkest most malarial swamps yeah. of the fucking amazon you're like, no, I will forge ahead uh, yeah. deeper and deeper into this. That was the idea. And so when it really took a turning point was when I had planned to go um, and do clandestine <laughs> ayahuasca, this place, which I, I didn't end up doing this uh, this one time, but it was in 
Colorado and I had uh I had uh this person had um Syrian rue um and are you familiar well so can MAOI? you explain you explained it to it's, me but i didn't realize a, what it a, was it's an maoi inhibitor and so uh that's what breaks down the dmt in your brain and so if you so ayahuasca has uh some maoi inhibitors in it that's why the experience lasts so much longer and so the idea is is that it's stopping your brain from breaking down the dmt so if you take it on its own, it's like a little bit of a natural antidepressant. But if you mix it with like DMT, it extends the experience and seems to heighten it as well and make it a little more clear. And um, I've heard I've heard there's like weird formulas that people have where they can eat Syrian roux and mix it with some kind of DMT containing mm-hmm. root or something. Like you you can sort of turn your own brain into the ayahuasca cauldron or something is that true like if you if you take syrian rue and then mix it with something that's got lots of dmt in it you'll start entering into a dmt experience from what i understand and a trusted friend once like was going to give this to me and he's like here this is take this with this and it's like a four-hour dmt trip but it's incredibly dangerous like i've also heard that people who fuck around syrian rue with other psychedelics end up having what's that neuro what's it called the uh, there's a name for like neurotoxic some kind of neuro shock sure. syndrome yeah but 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 the what can end up happening is you you just have like a mi- a migraine that makes you want to blow your brains out and who knows you could be simultaneously like causing like permanent right. damage right, to right, your right, right. synaptic cleft or whatever right. so yeah. that's what i've heard so syrian rue is a, a tricky dangerous yeah and was an alkaloid is that what it is what is it fuck if i know man honestly like you you would think someone with a science podcast that's also into psychedelics would do a bunch of research on psychedelics and i don't to be honest i uh i kind of am like i don't want it to influence my judgment of what is going on and you know i'm i'm busy my podcast we rarely talk about psychedelics so i'm usually busy um talking about it or studying like neuroscience or evolutionary biology and psychology and kind of that's sort of the wheelhouse for it very rarely do i talk about psychedelics how fascinating and how fascinating that in this one endeavor which is potentially incredibly dangerous mm-hmm. you are preventing yourself from gathering the requisite <laughs> data to it's, understand what you were doing. I'm glad I'm talking. <laughs> I mean, all of this is just like, it It really sounds so foolish. Now, it, it, like looking back at it, I'm a reckless person and I take enormous chances and I would like to stop. Di- you know, I'm getting older and I don't want to die or like hurt myself yeah. or anything, but I just like really... I've always been an adrenaline junkie and I've always, and I'm not like bragging about it. I'm like, now, now I look back, I'm like, well, I, I've always been just like an oblivious idiot in this way, like taking way too big of chances. Right. Well, no, I think, I don't think you seem like you're bragging. I think if anything, it's like beautiful that you're being completely forthright <laughs> because the job of a scientist is just to share the data. And this is what I would like more than anything is for people to know what my cognitive biases are, know what my flaws are. So when I present information, they can have a clearer picture of the information than what I'm yeah. able to present. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, what I that's love. beautiful. And it's important because it's like not like, concealing in like anytime you make yourself the what's the word anytime you make yourself the subject of the experiment Mm -hmm. it's your job to fully share every piece of data that you can recall with all the other people out there because in this case especially we need to really understand a few things one Mm -hmm. i think that's super important is this ridiculous idea that some people in the psychedelic community get, and I don't know how many of them out there actually have it, but I know certainly when it comes to like marijuana, when it comes to some of these psychoactive substances, there is this idea that I can take as much of this that I want Mm -hmm. for as long as I want with zero repercussions or, or even worse, zero risk that I'm engaged in you in a risk free activity and thus, uh, but that society in some way or another 
wants to trick us into thinking is is bad news when the reality of it is no matter what I, what you're doing running marathons being a vegan right. whatever the fucking healthy super healthy thing you're doing even in that there's some little percentile chance of risk and right. so it's really important with psychedelics i think mm-hmm. and especially when you have experience the psychedelic equivalent of a couple of broken feet right to make to get out there the data was like hey if your brain is throwing up these warning flags and you're starting to get indications of there being some kind of like you're starting to hear the thing clank around in the dryer (laughs) you know what i mean you you gotta like you must just take a little break. Yeah, right. Go to a maybe go to a psychiatrist. Go to a doctor. Yeah. Like slow it down. Share the data. Spend a few weeks slowing it down. A month, a year, two years. Share the data so that we out here in the psychedelic world mm-hmm. can listen to you and be like, oh fuck. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I gotta be careful. There, yeah, yeah. I, I hear there be like dragons. <laughs> right? Yeah, here yeah. There be I dragons. I would love for my story to be an example of like because i mean i think marijuana is a great example if you look at like dabbers out there like dabs are fucking crazy man and i think that some people are fucking ripping apart their minds with doing like way too many dabs all the time like i worry about that because sh- what, what i mean it's like once you habituate to anything that's why i didn't i wasn't I was a little more reckless with alcohol because I was like, well, alcohol is helping me. Like, so when I really started doing a lot of psychedelics, it was after the tour ended and I wanted to, I, the day after the tour ended, I quit drinking and smoking cigarettes. Those are two things that are a motherfucker to quit both at the same time. And so I increased, increased my dose. So, um, and it really worked and helped increase your dose of mushrooms. Yeah. And so, I was taking like larger quantities and, and so larger quantities is, what does that mean for you, Shane? So uh, over five grams pretty easily sometimes. And uh, that is, sometimes, yeah. so you're taking mega doses. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And this is, I remember in past conversations <laughs> I've had with you, it was really interesting because I'm, I'm not meaning to, uh, it's just like, yeah, you're not, you, right. if you feel like you're bragging, I don't think it's not yeah, that. It's I just know, like, I'm not bragging. No, it's like when I, I just got out of a fucking psych ward. I'm trying to put together the pieces yeah. of what happened too. Well, no, when I had, um, when I got ball cancer after people were like, my God, I'm sorry. Are you okay? The next thing that guys would always ask is like, so how'd you know? Was there like, a- <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? Of course, so, of course. Simultaneously, if, if like if people who are interested in psychedelics, psychonauts hear of a psychonaut going through this this thing that you went through, mm-hmm. we want to know how much were you taking, mm-hmm. how often were you taking it, yeah, and and what was the combination of things that you were doing, just so that we can like at least have some very broad idea of what your dosage was, what you were dosing yourself with. So to at least uh, like, so that and the, mushrooms are hard too. Cause there's all these different species and everything but else. Five, it's, come on, man. Five yeah. grams is insane. That's like five grams is the kind of thing that you, that you <laughs> do once a lifetime, like once an incarnation. Well, when you're doing mushrooms two, three times a week, um, it does seem like you kind of grow a bit of a tolerance for it, or okay. at least a tolerance for like just, the absurd um give an example of like a to- i'm just trying to imagine something where you're in the state of having devoured five grams of mushrooms something that, that you're tolerating that's absurd what kind of world were you living in, in in that state well i think that i could do three four grams of mushrooms and get and get go on with my day without I could hang out with people without people knowing. Are you anything seeing melting like walls? Are you seeing? No, I mean, even even in five grams, if I wasn't like by myself with my eyes closed meditating, in which case I would go into like the DMT like portal. But if I wasn't doing that, it was just like um, really creative writing a lot, 
like seemingly better ideas than normal. No visual distortions. I no mean, a little bit of that, vivid. but it's like I think the first time. I think when you first start doing psychedelics and you're like, look at the trees and the way the leaves are moving yeah. around, and like, holy shit. Yeah, and it's just kind of your brain having to get used to this new way of looking at this tree and sit and kind of maybe it's taking a little longer to process visual information than normal because other things are going on. I think after a while you just kind of get used to that. So yeah, I'm still kind of seeing the same thing. I like the idea no. that our brains are like, whoa, it's taking me a little longer to process visual data than usual. So I'm going to populate your visual field with fucking elves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's, I guess it's just taking me a little longer to process this data. Let me put some anthropomorphic, super intelligent entities surrounding you. So it's just to sort of like yeah. distract sure, you. While sure, sure. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it, what's funny about this story is that I was definitely like, the rest of the story is like, I can't believe what's coming out of my mouth. Because to be honest with you, you know, I'm always, I've always been the guy that's just like, it's just in your head. There's this multiverse inside your head. Yes. I don't believe that there's elves. I don't believe in like this interdimensional communication stuff. And then some things started happening that kind of opened me up to that possibility. And this was probably during the ayahuasca trip that you were talking about is where this went down so the first thing that happened was i went i hadn't done dmt in nine months because dmt started like i asked dmt to like show me proof that it was something else so i was like i would need like some sort of prediction or something like that so then what started happening was i would see like weird symbols and like codes in dmt space that i wouldn't that i would remember but i wouldn't be able to make sense of i wouldn't know anything about it and then I How would... How often were you entering DMT space? Because I can remember hanging out with you and realizing that you were you were going into that universe very regularly. Yeah. So how often would you say that you were dosing? It depends. I went in streaks. I mean, there was times that I did like DMT 10 times in a weekend and then times that I'd go like six months without doing DMT. But when you were I mean, doing 10 times in a weekend, it wasn't just the weekend. You were also probably doing it throughout the week, too. Well, so then I, I like, even when I wasn't, like, I consider DMT, like, breakthroughs as, as, uh, as like, a trip. And I've, I've had, like, a hundred of those. Okay. I've but, had, like, a hundred breakthroughs. But I was, like, smoking, like, a hit of DMT and, like, microdosing DMT quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. So you, you were, you, you were, like... Uh, a chron I don't want to like to use the word chronic because it's got negative connotations, sure. but you could say a psychiatrist would say, "Oh, he's a chronic right. user of right, DMT." Right, right, right. Yeah. So you're 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 vaporizing mm -hmm. DMT yeah. throughout the day, every day, mm -hmm. on and off. I wouldn't say every day. I would say a couple times a week at least. Okay. I was like microdosing, and okay. then probably. I think there was periods when at least once a week I was doing a breakthrough and then other times I was microdosing. And uh, because there's a lot of times in the beginning when I was just kind of playing around with like, how do you smoke this better? What's the best way? And, and then I started right toward the end of it when I took a break from DMT. I would go into DMT and it would be waiting for me and knew that I was going to be there in that exact location at that exact time breaking through to this other space. And like, I would get out of it and say, uh, we're say like this, I would look up at this painting on your wall and it would be covered in all of these uh, like codes that you're visual processing like the raw data of what this looks at some layer of perception that puts together this this picture um that can you describe like what that would have looked like so just a bunch of like symbols and it just kind of like the the matrix when yeah. when like the the people are in like codes or whatever i see like hebrew that. everywhere when i like whenever mm -hmm. i'm tripping out i'll see either hebrew or arabic or some kind of like Arabic lettering. Yeah. Actually, Alison Gray's secret language. She does a fairly good job of like, to the, the her paintings kind of remind me of the weird data set that suddenly yeah. begins to appear within the visual field. That mm. to me, I think, oh, is this like the root of language? Is this like some linguistic part of my brain projecting itself onto reality, or is this like the signature of like? 
God and every single thing or, or but for you it was more like it looked numeric more than um I would see some of those symbols as well but I couldn't make as much a sense of them as like numeric ish I would just see splashes of near numeric it was almost like when I saw numbers it was like show it was like simplifying it for me like numbers are this human construct um And so it was showing like, hey, this is code. And just so you understand that this is code, here are some numbers that you will recognize. So if I looked at this painting after a DMT trip, I would I would see it in the coding to make the painting was exactly what it was trying to show me three months ago. It was like, look at this. Remember this. Remember this. And then the next time I'd go in, it was like showing me that it could it could you, tell you keep ahead saying of time. It was showing me. What's it? I don't know. I thought it was just inside of my head. I thought that the inside of our head has this multiverse of perception where you have an idea and ideas take shape and form and they replicate and are run through these simulations and they build and the better an idea is, the more that it the more complicated the worlds it builds around itself to like obstacle courses to run through. I think that as I'm telling you ideas right now, it's uh you have your own ideas about what I'm saying, and sure. I think those ideas, uh, in certain, um, in in the right context, kind of mate and replicate. And now you have a new novel idea of your own that has just been born, and then and that's just like the genesis of an idea, and then that idea can kind of start running around in your head and if it's if it's like really fruitful and it survives enough tests inside of your head it eventually you're in the shower a month later and then you go oh i've got it that makes sense to me now yeah sure sure okay so, so it's like all these, was my calcul- it. these calculations going on in the background. You've got all these rainbow wheels swirling that <laughs> yeah. you don't even know are swirling because your mind is mushing together various ideas. And hopefully you get an epiphanous moment, which is yeah. the end result of a lot of microprocessing happening in the subconscious in your subconscious or something. So then when when I was like, you need to like I'd be arguing with these entities and like if I asked the entities what they were, they'd be like, oh, I'm everything. And then I'd be like, OK, well, what do I do with that? And they'd be like, well, just tell people <laughs> like, well, how do you how do you say it? how do you tell people about that? And so I would question them and I would just be like, no, this is you're just in my head and you don't realize that this is classic egocentrism. Everything that's in my head is everything that there is from your vantage point. And so you think that you're. You are like kind of controlling everything, but you're just controlling everything that's inside my head. And what you don't realize is there's this whole other layer out here. And, uh, and, and like, as so I'm wait, walking around through there. this. So this is like Sims in a computer yeah. getting in an argument with a computer. Yeah. Being like, hey, we control everything in the computer. And, yeah. and the computer being like, no, I'm a computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just live inside of my brain. Your, your existence is completely right. based on the boundaries of who I am, my identity, <laughs> my, right. my brain. So I, bad news, super hyperdimensional entities that have gotten to this egoic idea that you're somehow the, the godhead or whatever the fuck. No, you're not. You're just like your sims living inside Mm -hmm. shane's brain right okay keep going (laughs) (laughs) this is the argument you're having yes okay and so then i would (laughs) 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 and this is me trying to like normalize what's happening and what i'm seeing and trying to like rationalize it uh rationalize probably a better word and and so so you know, you go into DMT and it seems like you go to a different dimension. Absolutely. And so then after the fact, I'm like, no, that can't be it. It must yeah. have been this. And then I would like think of other things that I other observations that I want to make about it or ask it questions and like it, <laughs> and like see if I could like test it. And then it seemed like it was like as I did that more, it gained more awareness and it seemed like it was either I was gaining more awareness or it was, or together we are gaining more awareness. And uh, like I had one, one DMT experience where um, this dancing purple gypsy woman that I see all the time and other people see her as well. 
showed me that she was this idea that was she realized she's like really sad and she was never sad she was always like partying in this carnival and she was like she saw like this wall there was like she built this wall of code around her and she was doing this impromptu dance and like clawing against this raw lo- walls these walls of code this like prison of code yeah. that she had constructed and i couldn't tell if she was like saying to me that's where you are and don't realize it or if she was saying like i'm aware now that i am inside of your head and i'm just like i mean i always just kind of the simplified version is that this is like the movie inside out that's happening in your head where these there's these different worlds and you have these imaginary friends and i mean imaginary friends make so much sense when you're young and you have and you're just starting to get friends you need to imagine though and your brain's just starting to learn empathy and run these simulations so you start imagining possibilities of what an imaginary friend um of of what your friends could be like and what you want them to be like and that's a way of like running yourself through these simulations so you know how to behave better when you are in a real social situation sure like we all have self-talk and everything else so so then dmt started making these these kind of predictions and they started seemingly coming true and that's when I stopped smoking DMT because that was like, oh, I think I was wrong and maybe I shouldn't be messing around with these other dimensions or whatever. So you, you actually, so you sort of, you, you began to get a little bit of fear about it because mm-hmm. it, so it goes from being this very controllable thing, mm-hmm. which is, hey, you guys are, right. you're, just, you're just little... <laughs> training wheels that probably started when I was a kid to help me learn how to socialize. Right, exactly. You're certainly not outside of me. Right, right, right. Because if you're outside of me, then I can't control you anymore. And right. if you're inside of me, I'm in control. Well, that's a nice way of putting it. Sure. Um, but, I mean, it's scary either way because if there's simulations inside of your head, you certainly don't want them to, like... <laughs> You want to be careful that they're not like, oh, he's right. Like, <laughs> we're, we're, we've been working so hard just for this asshole to go around and like drown us with alcohol and all this shit, you know? Well, you don't want them to, you don't want the singularity to happen in your brain. You're saying if you're, if you've got these AIs, yeah. these neurological AIs running around, you don't want the AIs to gain sentience and then to gain sentience right. and then realize that they're way more powerful than the thing that thinks it's that's generating them and then now we run into the predicament that elon musk and everyone is saying we got to watch out because that's about to happen mm-hmm. to ai so you're saying this, this it's terrifying to have this singularity happen within your your mind yeah uh but also i think an interesting thing that emerges a lot when with especially the dmt the psychedelics is this concept of inside outside yeah right right so it, it's this idea of like well this is in me and this is outside of me yeah even though if you sort of zoom out all the way and look at you and me and the planet and it's been shown and said a billion different ways we're vapor we're just a fog that's kind of interacting with itself and right. if you pull back far enough there is no in or out it's it's all an out which means that the idea of oh this this is inside my head so in some way hierarchically and it's somehow less important than things outside my head is really just like looking in a microscope and saying well as i look at this bacteria you know the malaria bacteria it certainly isn't that dangerous because i could see it in, in inside of things mm-hmm. this tiny little thing and yet it's one of the most destructive things in the planet it kills so many people every single year so whatever these and by the way i don't mean to compare the dmt entities to malaria but to quote ramdas just because something doesn't have a body doesn't necessarily mean we can trust it and it doesn't and if there is some internalized or exteriorized how would you call it a panoply of sentience that manifests as various beings on every single level then if as above so below certainly in this particular dimension we're wandering around in Mm -hmm. there's meat bodies that you sure as fuck can't trust right you wouldn't leave them alone with your kids and definitely we have some prison cells are filled with 
meat body entities that if you release them, this just happened in Russia. Someone got released from a mental asylum and uh, immediately we went back to his aunt's house or to his sister's house, cut off her daughter's head and walked out in the street holding the head. They had to like put him back in. So it's like if as above, so below, if we have this level of depravity and violence that manifests in the exteriorized meat body world, then the idea that all extra dimensional entities that we encounter, whether they're subconscious or exteriorized, are going to be necessarily telling us just how it is, is a pretty naive thought, right? Yeah, I mean, so... That being said, that, whenever I run into the little babies, I love them. They're so sweet. They make I, me laugh. They're I beautiful. Know. It's glorious. Like I, they're they're. Well, I have, when I, even the malevolent ones that I encounter have their own kind of incredible beauty to them that implies to me that there's an ultimate benevolence to the universe. Yeah. But keep going. I didn't. I mean, to you no, no, you didn't. I mean, that it just makes me. It gives me so many other things that I want to say to the. I, I mean, so so I start thinking. You know, even even the first time, it wasn't more like, oh, I can control these things. It was more like, oh, I have no control over these things, and they can like this. The stuff in my head could turn against me at any time too, if it if it like gets wise to like what's happening. There's the and, paranoia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then, part of me was like, well, I should have empathy for the for the life that's inside of my head. And it, it was, it was more like, like I put it like, so you see this picture of the universe and it looks like this neural network, you know, that's kind of very similar to, um, to how, uh, how information flows around in our brains, you know? And, and so, so if the universe has some sort of sentience and then we're just like a little part of, of that, then it's, it's almost like mindfulness. What, what if, so what I would see on DMT was that there is this kind of um, hologram kind of it. It seemed like it seemed like the uh, the realm of possibilities. Like airplanes existed in the realm of possibilities before airplanes were right. actually yeah. made, and so this this realm of possibilities is just constantly growing, constantly cool. expanding. And it was, and when it expands enough and it gets complicated enough, it gains sentience and then it becomes aware of itself. So like the thing that made us was just becoming aware of itself. Yeah. It was making us without even realizing it. Just like we use mindfulness to learn more about like, rather than just being like, I'm happy or I'm sad. As we get older, we're able to articulate uh, our emotional states a little more and, yeah. and then, you know, and use MRIs to figure out, uh, you know, what, what's happening in our, specifically this does this sort of thing. And maybe the universe is also becoming mindful through yes. things that are able to, like the Sims are talking back to it. Um, and so it's kind of all like we're all waking up at the same it's sort like of hitting time. this crescendo yeah it's doing the thing in music right before the bass drop it's the <laughs> and we're like witnessing it in the form of technology right now yeah. it's like like it's your the thing happening inside of your mind the thing that these psychedelics are showing you is just another angle on what is happening in science and technology right now, which is that simultaneously to all of us sort of waking up to a lot of pretty hardcore realizations right now, collectively, the idea that we need to decentralize, that governments don't really mean that much, presidents don't really mean that much, no. boundaries don't really mean that much, states don't really mean that much, right. that we're all just like this kind of like... I keep using this word because I love it. Someone gave me this term and it, we're instantiating ourselves into time and we're like the sum total of a thing that's pushing itself into the present moment. And because of that, we have to start dropping all these like training wheels that we had attached to us, which is like kings, leaders, presidents, governments, bureaucracy, uh, laws as we understand them. We all, these things are have to like either transform with us or get 
they have to get dropped away. Yeah, they're just these stupid like evolutionary leftovers from having these uh, these social hierarchies that were kind of necessary at one point in the small tribe and now and so we still are kind of seeing like there's still we still in our minds see this strict higher where there's like one person at the top yeah. <laughs> and like that's so fucking silly yeah and inevitably like now especially that one person ends up always being a millionaire and that one person always ends up supporting laws legislation and like police forces that are mostly just designed to make sure that the millionaires don't have their money taken away from them by other people it's just all like a and it's not even based on some kind of humanized idea of anything it's just like let's figure out smart ways to create legislation that makes it so that the wealthy continue to be the wealthy while the non-wealthy continue to be the non-wealthy and the non-wealthy will do everything we can to make them comfortable so they don't get too uncomfortable because if they do that's when they're going to take our shit away from us but every single law anyway the whole point is yeah. now we're all starting to wake up to this realization of like wait a second i don't really think you are a president i yeah. don't think president means anything i don't know if government means anything and while we're coming to that realization similar to the realization the sims running around in your head are like wait a minute yeah. shane i don't necessarily know if you are running the show necessarily <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. we as a right. people are starting to scratch our chins and be like hmm wait a minute i don't really know if you bankers and and, and politicians and bureaucrats are necessarily running the show right now. And then while that's happening, yeah. Elon Musk is like, you guys better watch the fuck out because pretty soon your computers are going to be like, wait a minute. I don't really know if you're the one who's going to tell me what website to go to. I think I'm going to decide. And so we're looking at this. It, it might be that the Internet's already aware of itself. That's right. Yeah, that's right. We don't even know how far the awakening has happened. But to think that the awakening just happens technologically, that the awakening just happens societally, that the awakening just happens individually, is to not understand, I think, where we are in the course of human history or where things are going. No. And certainly, every single angle of society is telling us different versions of the same story uh, scientists are saying friends behold the climate it's fucking changing yeah. we've just witnessed it man mm -hmm. puerto rico is like un underwater and they say it's going to be without power for six months potentially right this is all the shit al gore was talking about in an inconvenient truth earthquakes the whole planet trembling right now the whole planet trembling to uh loons it different types of loons threatening nuclear annihilation against each other yeah and so what and, and all of this is interesting because it seems to be swirling around two major predictions that i like to think about a lot which is december 21st 2012 and 2045 2012 being the prediction for the end of the why the Mayan calendar mm. 2045 being uh, Ray Kurzweil's prediction for when the computers are going to wake up. So in this interesting little pocket of time, sure as shit, we're witnessing great tribulation, great disruption, great falling apart of systems. And it's happening internally and externally simultaneously. And if you tune into that just a little bit, you start shitting fucking bricks if you res if you're gonna resist it at all, and so that brings us to Shane having these sudden incredible realizations that are coming in mm -hmm. from the DMT field, which probably are mirroring a lot of realizations that are happening all over the planet right now. Yeah, I don't know. and uh, and so it, it it was a lot of. It, it was a lot of like th this thing was just starting to whatever's happened in my head or outside or whatever inside outside is as it's gaining awareness it also runs through the same kind of development that we do and it's just learning empathy so the idea being that if you make a simulation and, and it's great to have all these simulations quick and like some of them can just be a total disaster and it's like well then we know but then you run enough simulations and then you start realizing like, oh, these things are more complicated than I realize. Oh, they're, they're a lot more like me than I realize. Then you start having empathy for those simulations. And then 
it, it, at first when you're playing the game, you want to be like the hero or the bad guy or whatever. But then after you get bored with it, you take on the traits of like the peasants and and like yeah. then then eventually you play like the uh, the the person that you murdered in a previous version, <laughs> yeah. and then you realize what a horrific thing that you had done, and now you're trying to correct it and like steer the ship right. Yeah, and um, and then you become a Shane. <clears throat> right then you become a Shane which is what you are and, and like you know that's where you land for me that's always the big <coughs> psychedelic moment it's like you go into this state of disassociation and these and, and you, you you sort of manifest as like all of these things you experience mm-hmm. all of these you're just not you <coughs> you're the field of consciousness that illuminates matter in the form of sentience or whatever and for a little bit of time you get a little vacation from <clears throat> illuminating matter and then you go home and that's a wonderful place to be and yet because whatever this thing is that's going down seems to be attached to the illumination of matter <clears throat> suddenly after you've had this wonderful psychedelic vacation from entanglement with your meat body inevitably you come crashing right back fucking into your meat body. Mm-hmm. Sure, you you realize suddenly that we're the sum total of all experience in the universe and that every single person is like a sort of tributary through which the eternal consciousness is flowing. And that's a beautiful thing because for a little bit of time, you're not the fucking tributary. You're the field of non-differentiated consciousness, the manifest manifesting force. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly with psychedelics, all right. they, 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 they inevitably will pull you away and then BAM you're right back in your incarnation and now you gotta deal with being a Shane and then you gotta be, deal with being a Duncan yeah. and <coughs> or whoever you may happen to be right. and that's where the fucking work sets in isn't it yeah and I mean I kind of like that that's why I kind of uh, I mean I don't the, uh, I mean so what what happened in the end and that and i mean integration is my favorite part of psychedelics and so i was neglecting that recently and i i paid for that but uh what what kind of drove me is that i started i started like getting messages that seemed important and then i didn't want to believe that i was getting these uh messages that that's what was creeping me out basically i had i had um you're getting the old Moses go into Egypt and free my people from the Pharaoh. You're getting the classic burning bush <laughs> commandment from the universe saying to you, it's time, Shane, it's time for you to go into the world, represent me. You know that I am real now. I have revealed myself to you. <laughs> right? I, yeah, and I don't want that to be the case. No one ever does. Uh, yeah um yeah so like i painted myself to look like like a crazy person for the documentary because it was like um the idea was was that uh i'll have this attention getting you know like someone gets shot in the beginning of a movie and then two-thirds of the movie and then it goes three years earlier and then you see like what led up to that and then two-thirds in that actually that action happens and then you see what happens yeah, at, yeah, yeah. that's like the structure that we were trying to use and so i painted myself in way too much of the syrian rue so i'm like drenched, i'm drenched in mali inhibitors oh so you mean you were looking for a shot of you losing your fucking marbles like looking crazy so you were like okay let's do this i need so that it could this. go stop and then make me look normal here's how i got to this point yeah 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 right, yeah, okay, yeah right right but as it turns out, <laughs> it really happened. <laughs> <laughs> Self fulfilling. Ah, no, fuck you. I know, I know. So I painted myself like a lunatic. I'm like, I'll smoke DMT to get this shot. And I smoked it as I hadn't done it in nine months because the shit had been creeping me out. You are covered in MAO inhibitors. <laughs> yeah. You have painted yourself. What is it called? MAOI inhibitors. You have Syrian painted Rue, yourself yeah. with Syrian Glow Rue. in the dark. <laughs> You're glowing in the dark, uh, yeah. but your body, you've just covered yourself yeah. in a thing Correct. that prevents your brain right. from from offloading dmt it's mm-hmm. basically it shuts all the windows <laughs> you're hot boxing dmt in your brain yeah, yeah okay so then and then i smoked dmt and oh my god and, and right away <laughs> <laughs> and right away 
I see. It seemed like my memory of it was that there was four different parallel universes yeah. going at the exact same time, and there was this thing controlling all of them. And and right away, it was just like waiting for me. It was like, good, you brought the cameras. Now tell them <laughs> what, what is going on. And I'm like, what? And I, start, I started like laughing. And I'm like, how do I say that? How do I communicate this? Because I'm now deeply aware yeah. that I painted myself to look like a lunatic. Yeah. And now I have this thing that's like, oh, good. You, you, now you can tell people what this is. And afterwards, I was like, okay, well, I have no idea how to do that. And so um, then, and it was on my, and I was, Always afterwards, I'm just like, well, that's just DMT. DMT is crazy. You know, what, what are you going to do? And uh, I, clearly I missed it. I didn't remember that correctly. And I would encourage everyone to just not believe a word that's coming. I am telling the truth, but that's only the truth as I know it. And so I... I'm, what do you think someone's not going to believe about what you're saying? Uh, I mean, I kind of don't believe it. Believe like, what? I don't believe that there is this thing like reaching out like through me to tell everyone to like spread the message that there is this like other dimension that we can pop into anytime that's trying to deliver information to us i have a hard time believing well, we got to maintain agnosticism i mean this is the this is the recommendation of robert anton wilson and i cling to the recommendation sometimes mm. like a fucking bit of driftwood in the middle of an ocean sometimes yeah. when you're inevitably surrounded by the obvious truth which yeah. is that we live in a super intelligent universe that for whatever reason yeah. is instantiating itself temporarily in the form of our human incarnation and that this world that it's coming out of is a really beautiful paradise but also this place that we're in right now the other side of the coin it ain't so bad and this place could use some help and then you start thinking like oh so like maybe what this thing does is it picks quadrants of the multiverse to pour into through some kind of human vehicle linguistically artistically through action through social action through social justice through a basic vibe through going into a cave and burning incense or inventing some vaccine or coming up with some inspiring thing that you say to just the right person who invents the fucking cure for cancer whatever it may mm. be we're all just sort of <clears throat> nodes through which this healing force pours into time and so when you're realizing that's what's happening, and also when you start realizing, like, if you just make the vaguest indication to this healing force that you would really like to help it as much as possible, that's when it goes, great, you have the cameras on. Okay, let's get to work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have time to deal with, like, listen, I know I really want you to fucking believe that I exist. <laughs> yeah, 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 really, it doesn't give a shit. It's just like, okay, you want to help? Let's do this now. Yeah. We're going to do it now. And any kind of resistance to that compulsion produces all kinds of fucking problems. It's like mm -hmm trying to stand in front if you ever like know. if you ever um i can remember once when i almost smashed my legs to jelly i was uh <laughs> I, I was i was uh so i was like i'm at i i parked i got out of my fucking car right i got out of my car and <clears throat> i forgot i left it in drive i was just i don't it's so stupid i don't know if, i didn't put it i didn't i left it in drive i get out of the car i was oh fuck the car is rolling forward and for a second, I jump in front of the car with the absolutely ridiculous idea that I'm going to be able to stop the forward fucking momentum of this like car that I don't know how much it weighs, but it definitely weighs <laughs> right. way more than anything. I can stop the momentum. Realizing this in a millisecond, I like j had jumped out of the way as it smashes into the car in front of me, uh, right where my legs would have been. And it would have yeah. completely jellified my fucking legs had I tr gotten in the way of the fucking thing. So mm -hmm. what ends up happening is is that you, you realize that this resistance to the compulsion to help the world is actually causing all kinds of problems. But also there's a, the, the, anyway, my whole point is I must, ma I will constantly and always maintain agnosticism uh, and, and always allow myself the luxury of imagining these are thought experiments. I do not mm. have all the data. I cannot conclusively say there is a super intelligent healing force in the universe that is actively creating novelty with the intent of improving 
exponentially whatever particular mode or node of the multiverse it happens to pour into yet whenever i take psychedelics there does appear mm -hmm. to be some sort of sense that that's exactly what's going down and that to make this force even more attractive and beautiful it wants help yeah. it's not like it's like no i got this you guys i got this gang i'm going to take care of this myself it's recruiting anyone who will join in it's like hey can you help All right that we we got to do this man this is serious this is like a really beautiful spot here we can make it way more beautiful a trillion times billion times an amount that you can't even comprehend more beautiful we just need some help will you join us and if you get too caught up in that then you can start thinking not only will i join you i will be your only representative right and that's when you get in trouble too because now you're proselytizing some ridiculous concept right. and then people are like i don't want to hear what you have to say about this super intelligent force i know it's, i i don't i don't know what to do with that i mean basically Look, the thing this thing tells me to tell people, so I'm like, I'm telling people, but I don't, I don't. Let's that, hear what it has to that, say. Okay, here's the like thing. It. Let's imagine this, right? You're like the just for fun, and again, all <laughs> all, all thought experiment, uh, Shane. This is all thought okay. experiment, okay? No one believes yeah. it, and it doesn't believe it. It's just a fun game of make believe, okay? Okay. So let's imagine this: you are an emissary to someone from another. Can we say translator? You're a translator. I'm sure. And for whatever reason, you got abducted by an alien, and the alien wanted you to come down to, to the planet and translate a message for if, those of us here. What's the message? Well, it makes sense if you're someone that's already, like, if psychedelics are, are this way of this different form of communication, and now you have some uh, someone that's been traveling around the country doing a show about psychedelics, and then you also have a science podcast, so you've built this uh network of like neuroscientists and evolutionary psychologists and all that is it, like when I, when i'm like why am i supposed to like have uh, like why would you pick me that's that's uh, like the best i can come up with is just like well i can see why that would be a useful vehicle this stuff that i just happened to build and uh and so I, I guess I would say this um, when I when I finally did ayahuasca a few weeks later. What I would say to simplify it is that imagine you're sending out a signal, like so. So all of this digital information is going into space, right? And and so all of a sudden, and something's like receiving this information, and then all of a sudden it just like stops, and it was all of this incredible information, and we are these amazing novelty machines which the universe and and uh intelligence seems to like novelty seems to grow with novelty yeah it seems to ideas seem to rep uh, uh, reproduce themselves and and build on other ideas yeah. and seem to be kind of their own so scaffolding and and um and can I mean, one idea can set off this neural network and build entire worlds yeah, sure. inside of your head. Yeah. I, I mean, you can do this. And, and, and so, outside your head, too, obviously. I mean, we, there's so many ideas in history that created societies, movements, et cetera. So. so then you can go back and you can look at um, – so, so genes are also information. And if there's some time when all of a sudden – like – uh you you can see these these peaks uh like like whenever a species all of a sudden had like the, get, gets to this island where there's this abundance of everything it's ever needed its population yeah. just skyrockets yeah and then it eventually is is so well off that it ends up eating everything in that environment because yes. it reproduces so fast and then it crashes well we can see these little blips imagine something's like monitoring these little blips yes through information imagine imagine it's monitoring so you mentioned uh, here's a here's a good example of of like you mentioned the two lunatics with nuclear weapons that are yeah. arguing right now um and one of them just calls uh, uh, the other one a dotard yeah which sounds like retard so if you're uh, uh, to uh, you know which it sounds uh, to to like donald trump who wouldn't know I guarantee he doesn't know what that. Despite having all the best words, he wouldn't know what that word means because I didn't. I up. didn't know what it means. I had to look it up. I had to look it up. Everyone would. So it's this weird. So it's this word that didn't exist really. It was like its its numbers were very low in the population of information, and then all of a sudden everyone's looking this up. So this word itself has this spike. Peak. 
and, and information. And so it's almost like this save point in time. So if there's something, if, if there's something using some dimension of communication that doesn't have to adhere to time as we know yeah. it, it can use these kind of peaks and these save points to figure out when it needs to kind of adjust the timeline a okay, little gotcha. bit. Okay, gotcha. So like when mass focus is being placed on any particular variable within time and space, it would produce some kind of peak, which is interesting. You know, I, I think it's, who was it, the Noetic Institute? is like who, the, Someone does those amazing experiments with random number generators, and whenever there's a event that turns the consciousness of the world into any particular moment the random number generators start generating less random numbers you know about this no oh you got to check it out it's pretty trippy man it's pretty trippy yeah, yeah it's really interesting so it's like <clears throat> there appears to be definitely some kind of connection between consciousness and matter that's the thing that they're sort of like trying to to prove and you could it's great it's really interesting it's really crazy they put these fucking things around burning man actually and when like people are staring at the man burning there is a slight but statistically significant change in the generation of random numbers that seems to imply some kind of field of consciousness that in some way is interacting with matter mm -hmm. when people are focusing in on one thing. So it would, it does shift some, it quantifiably shifts matter. So this Kim Jong-un pops out a word. He's by the way, doesn't, he's like, this he, English is a second language. And, 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 son, and look at Donald Trump did it too with Cub Fief. Yeah. He created a word that did not exist and then all of a sudden just circulated. And it inflates with the inflates, consciousness yes. or atten atten attention. So, okay, yeah. so you're talking about, so, it sounds like you're talking about some kind of monitoring force is monitoring these upticks in like uh, perception or focus. Um, imagine we could monitor our own brain health with such accuracy that we could know like this part of your brain that is doing this abnormal amount of processing is seeming to have some issues and this is a very uh, the, the, this is a uh a, a very helpful part of, of like you the mean brain when you look at you your porn to... search history <laughs> yeah yeah like, why well, keep looking that up <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so so uh, human, it's like, oh, we're just like this speck in this thing. Yeah, but if we are, if we're processing information um, at at a rate and with an efficiency that is, uh, I mean, that we we can't find much else in in quite a long ways. Depending on what scale you want to use, that is processing information in the same uh, way that we're able to process it. Uh, that's that's got to be useful even even if that's just like one neuron yeah, uh, sure. uh, scale uh, you know sure. in the scale of it, it you wouldn't want that thing to necessarily die off if it's creating if if we're yeah. this novelty creating species and it's able to keep on coming up and now and now we are able to build robots that will eventually be able to process much faster than sure. we are and and so um that that's what i thought of after ayahuasca when i did ayahuasca it basically just um it it told me that i was supposed to tell people um about this way of communicating and was showing me all of this math and all of this code that didn't i used to be really good at math but i didn't I, I started doing drugs when I was 16 and kind of fell off. It needs, we need like physicists and mathematicians to like get in there is kind of what it's saying. And it's like, you can, you have a good way of communicating uh, the importance of this. So get out there and say it. And then I was like, okay. And then it was like, so are you ready to communicate this? And I was like, yeah. You know, I was just trying not to resist. I was just trying to be as accepting as possible. Sure. And then I felt like a, like a, just a, huge download of information in like it felt like a lightning bolt struck my head or something and this the whole house started rattling at the same time i thought it was just in my head and then afterwards i was like do you guys hear that huge sound like right by where i was and they're like yeah right right by, it's, we thought the house was going to collapse or something who and said then, that 
the other people in the ceremony and the ayahuasca ceremony and then we went down and there's this enormous crack in the foundation of this house like right under where my head was and that just like start i was like that's just a coincidence but it's like fucking with my head and then like that wait day, this is verifiable yeah. You 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 could like call you could like find these people and be like you guys felt something shaking in the house, right? Yeah, should I I mean I could call somebody. No, I believe right. you, man. Yeah. I'm just no no no. I'm not like really, this is for sure. I yeah. want proof. I'm just saying so like it's interesting. I still think it's like looking back I'm like it's just a coincidence. I it wasn't but it was like Well, okay, you could just at, say at not a, a coincidence. Point it's you could, like, here you could say you could say that like if we reverse engineer the fucking thing which I mean, I'm the most I'm a very woo woo person, Shane. Like yeah. I don't have, I, I can't even in fact believe that I would attempt to reverse engineer this because just for matters of like, uh, <clears throat> just as a form of ultimate maybe laziness or just out of the pleasure of allowing myself the thought experiment of imagining that there is, mm -hmm. mis there are mystical events that happen in the universe. I just be like, oh yeah, got some kind of alien download <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it shook the house. <laughs> And then, and then I'd probably, then I'd probably like look at the equations or whatever the thing was that this poor misguided thing wanted me to communicate. And I'd be like, yeah. whoops, wrong number, <laughs> I know. That's when I was like, remember when I clicked agree? I didn't read the terms and conditions. Like it was just so much information. Sorry. Like they just kept on saying, will you accept? And I just kept on clicking accept because every door that opened kept on getting cooler and cooler. No, and it we'll was really take it. Give it. I mean, give us the data. I mean, the, 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 I think like, you know, part of the fun of all of this is just like the moment you, the, so it's this very fun tightrope that we get to walk upon. And again, I, I do think like Robert Anton Wilson really taught us a lot about how to deal with this stuff, which was, listen, we can take it. We'll listen to you. We'll take these external forces and we'll like, We'll, we'll play around the idea that there are external forces guiding humanity and that we are all individually championing this force in our own subjective way to the best of our ability. But simultaneously, we can also fall back on the rather relaxing notion that this was just a fucking meltdown of the yeah. old bio computer. Yeah, yeah. I just did a little too much of yeah. the of the of the good stuff and some steam came out of my ears and my yeah. brain like had a kind of like the what amounts to nothing more than a particularly foul bout of cognitive flatulence that produced right. a, a series of delusional thoughts that made me right. think I was witnessing some pure absolute miraculous synchronicity somehow attached to the download of a super important data packet being transmitted by a extra dimensional entity into time but man you know i was just a little too high yeah. and i think that is a great way to deal with it because that way you no single one person has to feel responsible for being the messenger of this idea that is manifesting in all these man, different ways i don't <laughs> like if i'm some sort of messenger i'm all, i'm here to say like let's get let's get more people in to sort this out like i i don't want to i don't Great I don't idea. have the information at, at my like. I'm just not smart enough to interpret all of these weird codes. Monkey in and the space like, shuttle. I, I I I would love 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 for not not just. I I would like to see not just people in all kinds of science try ayahuasca or DMT and just see what they think, but maybe develop some studies that they could do. Maybe since since this time. I've had some like odd reconstructing happening in my head that I can feel. It feels like I it feels like a new sense that I didn't have before. And sometimes I'm like, D am I gonna have like a brain aneurysm or what's going on? And I would I would love to I would love for it to be falsified. I would like someone like I, this is what I asked for, but they won't just like, hey, I would like an EEG. They they don't just like give you mris or whatever for funsies they only they wait right. till something goes wrong you can't be like but no but i think that i can help and like <laughs> shane we got to do a kickstarter to get your your personal mri machine. i would love to because then i could be like see i was just making that shit up and that was like some psychosomatic thing and like Listen, i was feeling these pressures the, the, or like the here's the problem 
the problem is that the world that we're in right now doesn't really have the mechanism to deal with visionaries who are having these profound experiences, right? So, and 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 because of that, the, and also the other problem is guarantee. Like, so okay, I've got a radio, and for whatever reason, the radio starts picking up some transmission from an extraterrestrial radio station, right? Mm -hmm. Now my radio might be a piece of shit and that means there's going to be some static in the transmission and so i like if i really wanted to like and this happens i think with seti and stuff when they're scanning the skies they get these one of the things you're going to have to do is figure out a way to scrub the static out of the data set so that you can get like okay this is actually real this is the thing that i got versus this is like me having a fucking nervous breakdown or this is and or was it all me having a nervous yeah, breakdown or was it i think it could have been but the main thing that uh you know ramdas talks about this is his brother got put into a psychiatric hospital because his brother they found his brother in a room with a bunch of elderly ladies i think who were all calling him jesus and he was saying that he was Jesus, and so they put him in a psychiatric hospital, and Ramdas talks about sitting down with him, and he said to Ramdas, how is it that I'm in here and you're out there? You know, like, I'm in here because I think that I'm Jesus, and you're out there telling everyone, be here now, and how to love and be in the moment. Why aren't they committing you? And Ramdas's response was, well, because I think everyone's Jesus, and you think you're the only Jesus, and yeah, that's the yeah. difference. And so when you... When, right. when you sort of, first of all, relieve yourself of the ridiculous, you know, actually, God, forgive me for this. And I know you might have to go, but very quickly, somebody else, we were talking about. I, I, I have plenty. Of okay, time, great. But... We were talking about cleanup at Burning Man. And this funny thing happens where like in the, you wake up in the morning on the last day of Burning Man and you're like, I want to get the fuck out of here. I've got a reservation at the pepper mill. I'm going to hit that spa. I'm going to hit that fucking buffet. I'm going to like get my get, get a massage and scrub all this filth off of me and finally eat for the first time in 14 days. And you're like, so let's get this camp cleaned up as quickly as we can so that we can get out of here as quickly as we fucking can so we can enjoy the pepper mill. So what ends up happening is you start doing all the hard work. You're like, I'm going to get this camp cleaned up. It's 109 degrees. Many people in your camp are like, they had a big night because it's their last night at Burning Man. Sorry, mm -hmm. they're not going to wake up at... 8 a.m. and start packing up the fucking bar so that we can get out of here early but you're like i'm gonna get it all done that's what i was doing and by like one o'clock you realize that you've done absolutely nothing other than sort of like move a couple of things around and overheat making it so that when everyone starts working together you're actually a little less effective because you mm. wanted to do all the work yourself right and so in the same way it's like what can happen is we get this big information download and we start thinking i'm gonna do this myself yeah i'll be the only one doing this i don't want to do that shit by no, myself not no. at all no interest no one does we have to work together <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. we have to work together and right. like whatever it may be our i think the job is a translator for the divine that's the woo woo words i use for it sure. but if it's a translator for the subconscious if it's like figuring out like the deeper mathematical workings of the human brain yeah it's still very important it's all super important, yeah. and, and I think it's like there's nothing to be ashamed of about thinking that you're getting a message from the universe that wants you to tell that message to the world. The only place that you get into trouble is if you begin to think you're the only one getting that download, or, God forbid, you don't do a good enough job parsing the data, so you end up coming with a bad translation. Because right. the last thing we need... Right is to get like that's what i was so worried about that's uh, that was like the main thing that i was worried about and then i stayed up for like three weeks straight like i was sleeping like two hours a day and i was just like terrified i was like gonna be off on something and and like things things kept on happening like weird shit just kept on happening and i was and then it felt like and then i started getting paranoid and it started feeling like the thing was trying to kill me and i didn't know what was going on this is the moment to just we're just going to have to read the i'm going to have to read sure. a little bit from robert anton wilson sure. about chapel perilous hold on a second let me sure. just pull. all right so this is from the website technostics.com i just randomly pulled it up t e k g n o s t i c s.com 
<clears throat> the idea of chapel perilous, as it is commonly used in psychedelic parlance, comes from Robert Anton Wilson's counterculture classic, The Cosmic Trigger. Uncle Bob defines chapel perilous as a stage in the magical quest in which your maps turned out to be totally inadequate for the territory and you're completely lost. He has quite a lot more to say on the topic, having spent a good deal of time there himself. Chapel Perilous, like the mysterious entity called I, cannot be located in the time-space continuum. It is weightless, odorless, tasteless, and undetectable by ordinary instruments. Indeed, like the ego, it is even possible to deny that it is there. And yet, even more like the ego, once you are inside it, there doesn't seem to be any way to ever get out again until you suddenly discover that it has been brought into existence by thought and does not exist outside thought. Everything you fear is waiting with slavering jaws and chapel perilous, but if you are armed with the wand of intuition, the cup of sympathy, the sword of reason, and the pinnacle of valor, you will find there, the legends say, the medicine of metals, the elixir of life, the philosopher's stone, true happiness, true wisdom, and perfect happiness. That's what the legends always say, and the language of myth is poetically precise. For instance, if you go into that realm without the sword of reason, you will lose your mind. But at the same time, if you take only the sword of reason without, without the cup of sympathy, you'll lose your heart. Even more remarkably, if you approach without the wand of intuition, you can stand at the door for decades, never realizing you have arrived. You might think you were just waiting for a bus or wandering from room to room looking for your cigarettes, watching a TV show, or reading a cryptic and ambiguous book. Chapel Perilous is tricky in that way. Oh, cool. This is a quote from T. Ferry, who I met at Burning Man. I myself tend to think of Chapel Perilous as the place where you find yourself when the sheer absurdity of it all can no longer be ignored, when it all starts to add up and multiply while remaining somehow stubbornly indivisible, when synchronicity spirals out of control and you finally discover that you really are in fact the center and purpose of the universe after all. Either that or you're stone cold crazy, or maybe it's both. It's the dark night of the soul and it is generally understood to be some kind of trap, but it's also a doorway if one has the courage strength intelligence and luck to pass through it mm. that's what you experience if you ask me man that's what it sounds like to me yeah well i i mean i still and I, I and i could tell you the other things that happened like after that that were like weird and synchronicity kind of uh, which i i'm I'm not into like synchronicities like never have been. and and then all of a sudden i was like Deal well i can't deny it like the environment seems like it's changing in these weird ways around like i got uh like the i i got a strong message about this i had had someone on talking about the potential of doing a extended state dmt um with uh iv iv and having an anesthesiologist so you could do a longer dmt session than is uh you know the five to ten minutes or whatever and uh and and then and that was part of the ayahuasca experience was like that i needed to figure out a way of telling people that that everyone could go in this and benefit from from getting this in like you know like i said physicists and mathematicians but yeah. i think i think that most anyone i think like Anyone that looks at things a little bit differently, like a mechanic that figures out some novel way to fix things, like anybody. When I say like scientists, that's so uh, that's a little bit elitist. I think that everyone has. I, I think that genius is just in the ability to to look at a couple different. That's what uh, a lot of the best jokes are just looking at something in a different way than yes. people had noticed it before, putting together two ideas and combining them in this new novel way. And so everyone kind of has the ability uh, to do this. And so I get down off this mountain after putting a crack in the foundation with, a, <laughs> with my head or whatever. And, uh, and then the first text I get is this guy that's like, hey, we want you to be the first volunteer for this DMT extended state study. I'm yeah. like, what the fuck is happening? Yeah. And then just weird stuff ha started happening after that. Like I was like, okay, well, if I'm doing that, then it already happened in the future. So maybe this is what I would do to prove to myself that, and I'm like going through time paradoxes and stuff in my head, and I'm like, maybe I would give myself an envelope from a stranger. But let me just point and, out something here, yeah. man. It's really important to sure. acknowledge synchronicity. Sure, sure. So just so you know, the entire, I already did the opening for this podcast, which is about synchronicity. And also, just so you know, the thing That's I awesome. just read to you happens to be, I accidentally stumbled upon the quote 
by the person who gave me the word extantiating, which I've been using nonstop, T. Ferry, who happens to have read that last quote about the Chapel Perilous yeah. that I accidentally stumbled upon in the midst of us talking yeah, about yeah, yeah. synchronicity. So in a yeah. weird way, even in this moment right now. Can you define that word for me, by the way? What? What was the word that you were using? Oh, extantiate. So I was like sitting with like this genius T. Ferry who like writes for Arrowhead and uh, who's like a writer. She's just a brilliant site. She's really smart yeah. really smart and um uh the yeah the word that she gave me is extantiate which i don't even know if that's a real word i haven't looked it up yet i don't want to look it up yet i guess any word's a real word if you decide that it is yeah. but uh so the idea is like the thing that that i take away from the my experience in the dmt realm and i have far less i've clocked a lot less time wandering around in that place but whenever i go there my experience of it is like, oh, right, this is this is actually what I am. And this is what happens when you die. Mm -hmm. And my whole life that, that I'm experiencing right now has already happened. And I'm extantiating myself into time from this place. Mm -hmm. And that uh, my job, if there is a job or what I do is I come into the temporariness of Duncan Trusselness. And as much as I possibly can, I try to like, heal this Duncan Trusselness that's mm -hmm. instantiating into time. And then hopefully through that process over the course of infinite cycles, then I can begin to experience an upward spiral that would then result in more than likely traversing through various parts of the multiverse. And the further you updraft, the more synchronicities you experience until yeah. you reach some point that Taylor Deschardins describes as absolute complexity and absolute harmony, which would be the singularity. So that's what I guess my definition of extantiating would be. And uh, I think one of the qualities of beginning to wake up is that you begin to experience these pretty profound synchronicities that are actually, Ramdas talks about this, he says eventually gets to the point where you stop being like, wait, what the fuck? How the fuck did that happen? That's not possible, man. What are the odds to the point yeah. of where that's all you exist in yeah. is pure synchronicity. And that place in between the part of you that's completely out of touch, out of tune, sort of deharmonized, which is a place of what people call, man, I just have bad luck, I guess. Every day, bad luck, to the place of being like perfectly in tune with the progenitive force of the universe and experiencing the never-ending cosmic miracle of co constant annihilation and constant rebirth and exponential improvement. There's these periods of like, are you fucking kidding me? I just wait, we just ran into each other right here. I mean, we just happened to run into each other right here. How is that even? That's not even possible. If I right. mentioned that, something that's not even possible. And then in in that land, where you start getting hit with these hardcore synchronicities, you either have to be like, you know what, fuck this, and you really, in the mercy of the universe, will let you descend a little bit back down into the land of normal probability, and those synchronicities will begin to diminish mm -hmm. because the synchronicities increase. There is actually a more of a kind of nauseating feeling of like, I don't know if I'm ready for this. I don't know yeah. if I'm ready for this, and you might not be. And this is why, in a lot of spiritual systems, getting this kind of data downloaded was set up in an, in a series of well thought out initiatory period sitting with people who'd gone through it before who were teaching you these systems and like as best as they could understand it whereas now because we're all free balling it we're getting some of the same levels of downloads minus the council of elders or the group of magicians or the guru or the teachers where we can go to and be like Master, I had a dream. And right. they could say, oh, yes, well, water flows through the wind or whatever some Zen master <laughs> yeah, yeah. would say. You know, we're like, what? <laughs> so this is where we're at, right? So yeah. this is because this is, and this is what it's like to be instantiated into the West, isn't it? And especially to be here in the West. And this is why Ramdas, when he started taking LSD as Richard Albert, this is why he had Owsley whip up a batch of LSD and took it to India to give to people because he was like, I need a reference point for this state of consciousness. Right. I need other people to help me figure out what the fuck this is. And it was a team, you know, it's like a, he was hoping to 
get like information about what this was. And he ended up running into his guru, you know, but which where he got the final big ultimate sweet hi look it's here we're here we're we're here in different ways than over right. there i don't know i'm starting to sound like charles manson but the point is <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the point is that um we are um right now learning stuff yeah. and the rapidity with which you can learn it through psychedelics can be a, a little faster than you'd like to drive sometimes. No. And it can feel very lonely if you don't have a community of people around you right. who are having similar experiences, who can share data sets and figure out what's the static and what's the real juju. Right. And that's super important is being right. able to differentiate those two things. I started isolating myself toward the end and that's when like I, I should have been reaching out to people like you and other people because then I was just like really trying to do it all at my I was like if I tell people they're going to think I'm crazy I'm going to yeah. go to a psych ward and then I didn't sleep for three weeks which made me incredibly paranoid and things started falling apart. And then where'd you end up? In the psych ward. Yeah. Yeah. And which is when you're when you're a little paranoid <laughs> Putting someone in a place surrounded by cameras with people with clipboards monitoring your every move and like not knowing like, hey, wait, what are you writing right now? And then like, and you don't know, like you don't get a sentence. So you don't know like when you're leaving or anything like that. When you're first, like you don't know if you're in there for like two hours. You're subject or, like, to some ambiguous like like you just have to act in some way where they're like all right we can let you out in the wild again <laughs> and meanwhile i'm like picking up on all these patterns still so i'm like trying to behave based on these patterns but then there's other people like doing these actions based on patterns and they're starting to notice that i'm like picking up on a th uh, uh, so the other inmates are like like i'm doing these weird superstitious things and then they're like seeing me do that and then they're like oh should i be doing these weird superstitious things like forgetting my cup in place and then going back and getting it and putting it in another you know just doing these weird like yeah and uh and then when i finally got some sleep and like i needed like two or three days of sleep I was all better and then I realized that to get if you if you ever want to get out of a psych ward um just start cleaning up after yourself and start being like really helpful like as helpful <laughs> as you can be like help Okay, the can staff. I stop you right there? Yeah, absolutely. In the beginning I said what is the message? Yeah. that you are meant to give to the world. <laughs> yeah. And I think you just gave it. I know. It. Yeah. I think that we I I think that we need to start watching a little less TV and like fetishizing kind of the, these apocalyptic scenarios. And, and like, if you want to see the walking dead, like we walk past them all the time on the streets. And the more we try to ignore that problem, the more it just continues to grow. And it's becoming this monster of an issue and the opiate addiction and, and speed and everything else are just becoming this crippling, crippling, crippling system to uh, problem to humanity. And I think that we need to start like you go, oh, but I didn't make that mess. We might need to start being like, well, yeah, but I guess I got to pitch in and help That's pick right. it up a little bit. You want out of the psych ward? Start cleaning up after yourself and, and start helping people. Yeah. And if you do these two things, then eventually you'll get released. Yeah. And I think you really couldn't sum it up better because a lot of people claim we're in some kind of cosmic psych ward right now. We're like the, uh, the, the we are like the actually we are like God having various nervous breakdowns, I know. being dropped into the time space continuum <laughs> until we can fucking like get some sleep and shake it off. Right. And like the sum total realization is that incredible moment of understanding, which is that really all I can do, even if I'm seeing some spaceship equations floating around me, or even if I'm seeing the fundamental code of the universe incarnating or manifesting in paintings, ultimately all I can do is look around my own life and start cleaning up the mess yeah. and saying to people around me, how can I help you? Yeah. That's it. If you follow those two very simple principles, not only will your life begin to get a lot better, but certainly people around you will begin to change simultaneously. Doors will start opening. Doors will start opening. And when you're ready for them to not be open anymore, they'll shut. Yeah. And that's just fine. Because I yeah. think ultimately we're dealing with a benevolent, polite 
force. It's like, right. okay, okay. Here's what you're ready for. Oh shit. You went in the fucking med. You went to, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm not putting any locks on the doors of this house, but there's yeah, a yeah. reason I was like, don't go into that room just yet. Right. Check these out <laughs> first, Shane. But you're like, I want to go in that room. <laughs> yeah. And maybe this being, or this force understands Shane enough to know that the best way to get him into the room that you wanted him into in the first place was to tell him not to go there. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't Who knows? Know. But I think that, uh, I think that, that, uh, from being around you now, it feels like this was the, you, you needed this, right? You needed I feel this. like a very different person. Better or worse? Better. Uh, in many ways. I mean, now I'm, now I'm like looking at, now I'm looking at the mess that I had made of my, and I'm like, oh, there is a lot of mess around me that yeah. I wasn't cleaning up that I didn't, I was like trying to ignore before. And so now I definitely have to get to work, but, uh, I definitely, I mean, there was points when I had to go through every mistake that I had ever made. I was like confessing shit to my girlfriend that was like unnecessary of like, and I checked out your friend one night. She's like, wait, why are you telling me this? I was like, this real. You're confessing. <laughs> I had to confess like, and thank God I'm not like into bestiality or something like that because it would have all had to come out. Like I was like, I was just like so grateful that I'm just like, fairly like i don't have a lot of like crazy fetish also you got a cool girlfriend and i have a cool girlfriend who's a social worker and and is used to like dealing with like mental health issues and whatnot so she took it and was there for me for as long as you know when she finally broke all this crazy shit happened and and when she finally broke was when I decided the next step was that we needed to elope and that she needed to have my baby that's when she was like you got to go to the hospital because you're fucking crazy. <laughs> you're fucking crazy. All the other stuff she was fine with. The time travel shit, I got Shane. <laughs> yeah. But we aren't fucking eloping. <laughs> yeah, some grand romantic gesture. Yeah. You've lost your fucking mind. This we, is not the Shane that I know. This is why we need a good community around us. If you're going to be an explorer in these, in these right. distant realms, we need a good community around us to help us parse the static from the transmission yeah. and, and 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 you need a a group of people around you that can do that in a forgiving way where no. it's like in this fucking society you you know you break your leg and people want to sign the fucking cast yeah but in this society you like overheat the brain and people act like you've got leprosy or right, something right, and right. it's the most re- ridiculous stigmatization I know. of people who are ultimately fearless trying to really go far out and to really understand what it is to be alive and to be a human and yet when somebody goes out and like i don't know has to get pulled back to shore and like you know re- like have, have it resuscitated yeah everyone's like oh my god what no. Well, whereas it's like, come on, man. It's like we if you have a strong enough community around you, yeah. which you need. And this is this goes back to just some basic fundamental principles of the use of psychedelics that you completely I've been doing them by myself for a very long time. You ignored a lot yeah. of the real basic rules, <laughs> right, right. which is, you know, just just That's basic true. basic stuff, yeah, yeah. which is, you know, you want to do you want to be around people that you love. Yeah. You want to share the data sets. You want to make sure that you're like, and you, and, and also you need to know what it is that you're consuming and why it's doing what it's doing and right. why are you doing it? It sounds like, you know, so, so you broke some rules and yeah. whenever you break the rules, especially the psychedelics, you get a spanking and, yeah. and the spanking can be anywhere from like an uncomfortable ayahuasca trip to ending up in a psychiatric hospital. Yeah. And this is why it's like, you know, there is something in your story that is like a cautionary tale. Yeah, yeah. But mixed in with it is the paradoxical realization that sometimes kicking over the ant's nest, the nervous breakdown, or what we call a nervous breakdown, the meltdown, the disintegration of the ego is generally followed by a reintegration that is way better than the thing that got disintegrated. Yeah. And it's just in that interim period between disintegration and reintegration, we need to make sure that we have a community around us that can uh, 
unconditionally love us during that period. And, and right. that's really important. And if you don't have that and you're taking massive amounts of psychedelics, then you need to rethink it a little bit, yeah. you know, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, m maybe this, uh, maybe this whole thing isn't for me to like figure out space time. It's to just, maybe now I can comment on, on mental health and the stigma a little bit more as someone that has, uh, had their head broken into pieces and had to reconstruct it. Yeah, man. I, I, I think it's all, it's all the above. It's like, yeah. we don't have to like limit ourselves to just saying kind of obvious parables of responsible psychedelic use. We can unlimit ourselves and as much as possible. If, I mean, look, I, look, I'm, I'm not trying to enable some kind of manic state here or anything like that. But if we look at Nikola Tesla or any great innovator, these ideas, when they come, sometimes they're overwhelming they're, I mean, Jesus Christ, like uh, uh, Paul LaFollet, one of my favorite artists, an amazing human. He's not in the human realm anymore, but he thought he had an alien implant in his head. And all of his paintings were based on the what he, I think, would say were transmissions coming from, you know, for, for uh, using a completely lazy word, aliens. But, uh, um, I remember running into him in the beginning of my, I don't know what you would call it, but when you just start stepping down the path, running into him, and the first thing he said to me was, you know there's no up or down, right? Like there's no such thing as up or down. Mm -hmm. Like if you're in space, there's no up or down or right. left or right. So he's trying to explain these very basic principles to me just as a matter of like i guess this is just when he gets around someone who seems vaguely interested that's one of the first things he starts trying to break down right. before he gets into the deeper stuff somewhere in the midst of that he read my palm and it was pretty awesome but anyway the whole point is you it's not fair to you to try to write off the data set as just a manic state it's really important to like look at it and figure it out. What are these forms? Can they be drawn? Can it be mm -hmm. painted? Can it be spoken? If this painting that you were talking about manifests as like some series of equations in the deeper b brain, then in what you got sounds like some kind of big bundle of equations. Well, your job would then be to like figure out to f to figure out when those equations become form that could be describable, and then not just when they become form that can be describable, you need to be able to dumb it down right. times a million. And it sounds like at some point where it gets to is clean up after yourself and help people. Right. But maybe there's other levels of it that are far beyond that that who knows who knows what it could be shane you've I got know. a scientific mind you you are a scientist <laughs> and you're friends with a bunch of scientists so who knows we don't know we've got to figure yeah. out what this thing was that came to you how much is static how much is real right. how much is egomania how much is a manic yeah. state how much is narcissism how much is a messiah complex right and shit did you get anything maybe you got some real thing in there who the fuck knows man <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's, that's definitely the, the thing that like afterwards is like, oh, that was just my ego. That was just some Messiah complex. And that, and that's the stuff that's like, ah, oh, it's so embarrassing. And then, and then I, when I step back from that, I'm like, oh no, there was some, there was some solid idea. Like when I look back at the stuff that I was writing and drawing and I'm not a drawer, usually I was like, oh, there's, there's definitely uh some stuff there that that happened and, and whether that's just because i was tapping into our our inner world and it's just uh, normally we can't tap into that who knows yeah who does knows? it i mean the thing is like inner outer inner spaceship right. outer spaceship right the whole point is let's just forget about the whole inner outer thing and right. let's face it sometimes people have epiphanies and sometimes that epiphany has within it uh, something that becomes a great work of art, an amazing play, a movie, an invention, an innovation, some addition to a school of thought, some, you know, it's right. who, who knows. And the, the way you beautifully earlier, you're talking about in a really beautiful way, which is like our brains are like these rainbow, we are parsing out this data and we're, we don't know. And then suddenly you're in the shower and you're like, whoa. Yeah. But sometimes you're not in the shower. Right. Sometimes you're in a fucking ayahuasca ceremony and you cause an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> and it's and, and it happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, well, this happened. And I can confirm it with all these people around me. So I know that this happened. So then what was that? Yeah. And then is my art is me talking about it doing a disservice to the thing it was trying to tell me because it makes people like, You're crazy. Yeah. That, you know, so right. I do think that there's like a, And there and there was rain there recently and stuff like that and it's a, out of mountain and, you know, things things like that. Plenty can of ways or or even the event happened. And, and preceded your epiphany by a millisecond, so that, right. you know what I mean. Then my consciousness, like, yeah, yeah, like I, I didn't. I felt like the rumblings of it ahead of time, and then try. in my your brain my was like, oh, here it is, data download. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? I think that I, I've thought about that a lot, and I right. think that's very much a very reasonable explanation. Yeah. For, well, again, it's like I honestly, if I'm like watching a great play, or if I'm experiencing some kind of like. I don't know, product of medicine or if like someone is like doing something with me or to me that's really quite beautiful, I don't really give a shit whether Mm -hmm. or not they got their information because of their brain's response to a tremor or whether their brain caused the tremor. What would matter to me, even though I would find that to be pretty amazing, what would be more, I guess, pragmatic is the information itself. It's like right. the thing itself, the, what, what, what'd you get? And I think what, well, this is the idea. I mean, isn't this what David Lynch talks about? And I don't remember the book about fishing. He's like, you're, we're catching fish, man. We're catching fish. You caught a fish. Mm-hmm. What'd you catch? Is this just a basic fish here? Or did you catch a fucking mermaid baby? And if you did, let's take a look. Cause it means there's an Atlantis. And if there's an Atlantis, can we find it? Where is it? Is it real? That's what we're doing. You know, we're out yeah. there fishing and our job is to fearless one. You want to be in the company of other fishermen so that when you throw the fish on the, on the, on the fucking deck of the ship, the fishermen can help you figure out what it is that you caught and like what it compares to, or does it compare to anything or does it not? And if this is such a powerful fish that temporarily you're trying to marry some of us and get us pregnant, then we've got to have a place on the <laughs> boat where you can go down and relax while we check out the fish. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> 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 that's, that's hilarious well, let's make the place on the boat like yeah. let's put some oriental carpets we'll burn some palo santo yeah. let's play some beautiful music let's have some massages happening let's have some like if necessary some benzos or something to like help you get some sleep let's have a nice like safe beautiful place where we can where, where you can like enjoy relaxing after a lot of a lot of hard fishing oh. and a lot of like being out there doing some really hard work let's make it a place like that instead of a place with fucking security cameras everywhere and that pe- shit was scary yeah <laughs> it was real scary well this is like why we have to evolve better ways to yeah. deal with um these like heightened states of consciousness this is why the zendo project's so fucking cool that yeah. maps is doing you know or that it's, it's so such a beautiful thing because it produces a place where people can go to it, where they're around people who are like not like me, woo woo is gonna be like, maybe you did contact the crystal people. <laughs> <laughs> That's not necessarily you wanna be around necessarily. It's yeah, right. more cool to be around like my like Cole Marta or yeah, you know, yeah. people like that who are like trained and can be like, Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. We're gonna I'm gonna listen to you and not judge you and we're you're All safe. Right. And we're gonna just let time do its thing. Yeah. And usually when time does its thing that's when you're like, oh, I got some sleep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that would have happened eventually, and I was like a little bummed out that I kind of got tranquilized before I could finish the defrag process. But I think it's still happening. This is like six weeks later, and I'm still feeling like um, there's there's some new connections being happened. And I'm tuned into some other thing that I haven't been before. So it's kind of interesting. It's exciting news for all of us. I don't know. It's good news, Shane, and it is spooky, but God damn it, don't you love spooky? I do. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. There was points of it when I got I got really scared for the the people that I cared about that that, you know. Yeah, you're right. You're right, man. I'm so you know, again, like I'm yeah. I think there's a lot of I my tendency is to I'm a woo-woo person. I yeah. know you 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 and I think when, you know, when I when I heard what was going down with you, 
I'm not going to act like I'm like, nah, man, he's just going through a thing. Right. I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah. I hope Shane's okay. Right, right. Hope he didn't break his brain. Yeah. Oh, my God. I yeah. hope he's okay. Right. So, yeah, you know, I, like I, there does need to be a responsible approach to this. And you were irresponsible and you need to be. And you, but, you know, in the regardless, we can't like beat ourselves. Oh, is he irresponsible? That's not going to help. That's not going to help anything. I like Tim what Timothy Leary said. Sometimes we just have to lift up our legs and float downstream. And mm. that's it, man. You just surrender to it, let go, go through the birth canal, and let it happen. Don't try to, like, dig your little infantile fingers into the fucking walls of your mother's womb in a desperate attempt to prevent your birth into right. some new dimension number one it's not going to work number two it's going to hurt your mommy and number three right. it's like going to hurt you what's the point let let it happen let yeah. go as much as you can and the more you do that i think the more beautiful the ride becomes but the more you're like no Well, you know, it could, that's where shit gets the resistance. Yeah, I know. This is what the maps people say. The only way out is through. Right. That's it. That's the quintessential psychedelic challenging trip bit of wisdom that if you can have someone around you to remind you of that, then it makes it a lot, a lot, it makes it a little more, a little less spooky, I guess, the word for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what through what through is exactly and what direction that is. But uh, I'll just let, yeah, I'm trying to let it happen. Yeah. And I think it's exciting for all of us, man. I'm, and I'm like really looking forward to <laughs> the progressive realizations that you like. I think us. that they might all be a whole lot of nothing. That's a realization in its own yeah. right, isn't it? Yeah. Even that, even if like what your final like thing is that no <laughs> yeah. you know this is no man this is just like an overheating of the this is what happens when you overheat the human yeah. brain hey that helps us too i think any bit of information that you bring back from these states of consciousness that we're just starting to figure out and that we're only now being allowed to study scientifically is information that we all need mm. and even though your ability to like look at the information from an objective pov is compromised completely by the fact that you're the subject of your own experiment at right. least other people can like right. listen to what you you have to say and from that figure out like well what is this i mean we do know when people smoke dmt they do kind of enter into a a, a state of consciousness is interesting in the sense of it's got this continuity that seems mm. to not be limited to the individual but groups of people who've taken it together report similar geometries similar contact with entities similar places where even when i was telling you my experience you were like was it like liquid metal and i'm like yeah that place yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's something to it that's really interesting yeah. in the sense that it is a shared space yeah and that means it's quantifiable and yeah. that means if it's quantifiable, then it, it, whether it's an inside or outside place, it's definitely worth quantifying because quantification just from a basic level is lots of fun. But from another perspective, it's like, shit, man, if this is a place, maybe there's other ways to get there. And maybe there's other ways to bring that place into this world yeah. beyond art, beyond language, beyond poetry, beyond music. Shit, maybe there's a way to extantiate this place in the form of technology maybe there's a way to like really let it come into here in a more profound way that isn't limited to the ability of the human mind to articulate it i think it's quite possible that we're doing math just a little bit wrong and we're not looking at math correctly and i think that it's possible that there is a way of communicating information we've had these big leaps in ways of communicating information throughout all of human history that have been that have kind of changed everything and that we we now it's very normal to like any kid can pick up a tablet and like understand it instantly and it's very intuitive and it's this brand new language that that has changed everything and i think that there's new ways of communicating out there that we like i think that when people see what it is it's going to be like oh Duh, like, of course, right. it was right, yeah, it was right under our nose. The equal sign was just a little bit fucking tilted the wrong way. Yeah, that's and like funny. Stuff, stuff like that. Shane, you know what would suck? 
<laughs> if all of a sudden we like kind of like come to and we realize we're in a psychiatric hospital. I know. That's what I other. can't fucking <laughs> get out of my head. It's like, oh, no. we, we, we like come to and realize we're just patients in a psychiatric hospital. Oh, I, I'm know. holding a ketchup bottle. Ah, you're like, this, instead of as microphone. you're saying this, I'm like, no, that's probably <laughs> what it is. Fuck. <laughs> We're both holding ketchup bottles right now. We're like holding I'm ketchup sure bottles. We've got like an ashtray. Uh, We're acting like it's our recording device. People are, people are just walking uh, by, shaking their heads like, there they go again. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm like, as Duncan's saying this, he's creating it on this other timeline. So now it is happening. Well, it's, a, it's the Gnostic idea, man. I mean, this is the idea. This, the problem is, is this is the idea. This is what Philip K. Dick hits upon. And this is like the root paranoia is like this idea of like, oh, no, you really are in a psychiatric hospital. Only the psychiatric hospital isn't a human psychiatric hospital. You're literally in some kind of soul prison. Like we're all being it's the you know, everyone's like, that's like the Matrix. But it's yeah, like, yeah. no, the Matrix it, it's, has its roots in Gnosticism. Right. And that's the to, to with my very, very very confused understanding of it. I tried reading a book on it. What's interesting about a lot of what we know about Gnosticism, according to this book, is actually taken from early Christians talking shit about Gnosticism. So like they to like even understand like a lot of what they were saying, you had to like look at like people are like, here's why it's wrong, who are, you know, professing a, an, an equally ridiculous concept. So but yeah, one of the ideas, one of the takeaways from it is this idea like we are in a kind of like uh, prison Gnostics out there, just forgive me, okay, man? You know I go on and on about this shit, and I don't know what I'm talking about. At least I, I admit it. But my really muddied understanding of it is that, uh, so sort of like the prison that we're in is a prison being run. The prison guards are really into authority, and they're really into hierarchy, and they're really into... Um, uh, making people submit to the rule of law. And so when you run into like a, uh, like anyone who's trying to enforce any kind of hierarchical authoritarian structure, you're actually running into a priest who is a servant of these beings in this prison of time that we're currently in. Mm -hmm. So that's what authoritarians, fascists, and all these people are actually servants of these extra dimensional entities that for whatever reason have decided to place a dome on top of the particular little bit of sentience that the universe is instantiating as human incarnation or whatever. It's a really creepy, trippy idea, but yeah, that, that, that freak out that lots of us have where it's like, shit, man, I think everything's, this whole thing has been like placed around me as some kind of test or am I being tested or what is this? Or am I being watched? I'm meant to be being watched. Is this Ram Dass's first, one of his first reactions to meeting Neem Karoli Baba, who was like telepathic and looked in, could see through his entire ego identity was that one of the first thoughts that popped into his head was, is this a CIA experiment? Am I in a, is this some kind of fucking CIA MK ultra bullshit? And like, I'm around someone who's like, doing something to yeah. me so anyway the point yeah, yeah. is this idea of, is actually a it, it ha it's an archetypical idea and and again for me where i'm at with it right now is i s surrender to the idea that it is benevolent i surrender to the idea that the process is noble compassionate and healing ultimately and that i am part of the process and that I am, um, uh, I'm completely safe, and that in all, com in all aspects of the continuum of human experience, if you really study any given moment or mind moment, you realize that that moment itself is perfect, even as spooky as that moment may be. The final analysis for me is that when I come across even my darkest moments is that those dark moments are a different flavor of ecstasy and mm -hmm. that we're in an ecstatic space that uh, is sometimes has these moments of uh, ecstatic terror, fear, paranoia, ecstatic sadness and heartbreak, but ultimately it feels completely benevolent and sweet and it's a wonderful thing to get to share and be part of i like 
this node of the multiverse. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that during ayahuasca when I had the purge, which I was always like a little skeptical when people are like, "Oh, the purge is all part of it or whatever," but it was all part, like it was during this storyline of when I saw like all of human suffering, but that but that like God was suffering as well and also experiencing like withdrawal yeah. and addiction issues of like it's having to build all of these worlds all of the time and and uh and and this purge happened just at the right time and i i remember i was off of like the blanket i was just laying on the on the wood on the uncomfortable wood no padding or anything and had just purged and and like it felt like this flow of human suffering just running through me and there was something so beautiful about it and i really believe that it's our mission to i mean we we can't stop death is all a part of it but we can we can stop we can we can limit suffering i i I think and that was a big message that i got from it but when i experienced all the suffering it was just like it was this beautiful like oh that's what's important that's what needs that's what we need to be working on is the suffering of others and yeah. trying to limit that as much as we can that's the that is the game man and yeah. it's a great game to play and this you know what man this little place that we're at here it deserves it this is i love this place and the reason we keep coming back here is because we love it man and a lot of people are like oh no you're you keep coming back here because you're attached well i'm attached to it because it's beautiful Mm -hmm. it's beautiful here man and it deserves our love and it deserves exactly what you're talking about it deserves it Mm -hmm. it's worth it's worth it if you just look around it's like yeah sure we don't have flying fucking cars yet nobody's teleporting we're still like having to deal with basic stuff we but man this place that we're in right now, it's glorious and it deserves our love. So I think what you're saying is exactly it. And that realization is, a, is we just have to keep reminding ourselves of that or because um, a lot of people don't realize that they think we're in a fucking toxic shit heap of catastrophic randomosity that just is like accidentally temporarily come to some sense of awareness of itself and is going to obliviate or dissipate in that nothingness again and the whole goddamn thing is just a big swirling fucking cosmic dump being flushed down the toilet at a time and that's a depressing outlook man i don't think that is how what's going down here i get sucked into the little bits of that here and there and it's just it i think it's i mean i would normally call it just like a negativity bias of just like this trying to survive by focusing on the worst of the but it's such a counterintuitive way of looking at life and i i think that people are uh the the main thing that i'm concerned about i think that a lot of people are learning helplessness a lot of people are suffering they feel helpless and they're just missing so many opportunities because of that it's clouding their judgment so much that that's all they see and that's all they want to see and uh and they're just missing a great deal of doors that are opening all around them that they've already been untrained they've already been trained not to bother walking through damn that's beautiful man and they're also missing a bunch of doors they need to be opening up for other people yeah yeah that's the other thing too you know they need to be like we're all in it together you know we're all here we popped into time we're gonna spend a little bit of time here and while we're here we're like let's polish this place up yeah. You know, as much as we can to the best of our abilities, just it doesn't really matter what job you're taking, whether it's like something very, very seemingly mundane or something really profound, whether you're coming up with some crunch and some code to come up with a more advanced solar panel or whether you're just like helping people carry their furniture right. or like getting people blankets because they're cold or whether you're like, what well, it doesn't matter. The whole point is like we're here now. We've come in for the build. We're here to do some work. Let's do it with right. the intention of like polishing this place up. Yeah. And the more you do that, everything works out. You know, that everything just seems to flow. And the more you don't do that, well, that's when like you start getting into the goddamn stuttery road bumps of life and everything freezes up, you know? Right. But it's just the problem is when you, it's really scary for people to realize that not only are you a helper, but if you let yourself, you're going to be helped. Yeah. And you're going to be helped by literally 
every single thing around you and that's when the synchronicities start and that's when you start feeling like you're going a little cuckoo brains yeah, <laughs> yeah man ah <laughs> uh, that's it's it's like it's like deja vu but for days on end rather than just like ooh, that was a quick three second deja vu that was kind of weird yeah, man. yeah. Yeah. Days and days on end. Days on end. And then, the you know, the more with deja vu, it's just like that you just stop resisting. You're just like, mm-hmm. okay, this is how it works. And I'll tell you, man, I guarantee when we die, finally, and we're laying on our deathbeds, there's going to be the identical form of resistance to the, these moments of transcendent synchronicity. We're going to experience these moments of resistance as we begin to let go of our physical bodies. And the that, this is why... You know, they say meditation is the training for death. Psychedelics are the training for death. And the, the more we can learn right now to let go of these resistances to these moments of at what, if you really look at it, they're beautiful moments of epiphanous as what uh, Terrence McKenna calls the DMT, a Niagara's of epiphanous beauty. Mm. And the more that we like stop resisting being the Niagara itself and having this like beauty flow out of us into time, then that's going to, how much easier it is going to be for us to let go of our meat bodies when we finally expire, you know, mm-hmm. cause that's like, a, that's a really uncomfortable spot. A lot of people get into, and it's the ultimate psychedelic moment as the release of the physical body back into the infinite. So, you know, the thing is, if we can learn it now, we can learn it then. And, and in the meantime, as we're learning it, we can sure polish up this little fucking psychiatric hospital yeah, called human incarnation so. we can start rearranging some of the furniture we can maybe actually start using real microphones instead of ketchup bottles <laughs> <laughs> hey get us some microphones in here man <laughs> <laughs> hey it's his lunch i want my fucking pills <laughs> <laughs> I love That's you, That's where we are. I love you too, buddy. Thank Thanks. you for doing this. I should this. have talked to you much earlier. Next time? I should have. Now we know. Now we know. And then we'll get you into the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> At least like, you'll have someone to talk to on the way yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, same for me, man. Please, commit me when it's time. I'm not afraid. But <laughs> yeah, we all need people to talk to, man. And, yeah. I, and I feel like you're that for me, and I hope you know what Yeah, that thanks, is. man. That was Shane Moss, everybody. You can listen to his podcast by going to herewearepodcast.com. All links to get to Shane will be in the comments section of this episode at duncantrussell.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, Squarespace. Thank you, TrackR, for sponsoring this episode. I'll see you guys very soon. Hare Krishna.